even going out into nature for 20 minutes. These are ways we can take back our brain. Brain food is like, oh, it's expensive elitist stuff. It's like, how about a $199 tin of anchovies? <laughs> and you're gonna have the best brain food on the planet. So if somebody's getting shocked all the time, that's a reason to pay attention to this category? That's correct. They're not just part of a Marvel movie, but. Can you describe the landscape, landscape and the state of threats that our brains are under today? Sure. Well, let's start with one of the most important and probably most straightforward of these. It's food. We need food. We need to eat food to keep going. But what is it that we're putting into our bodies? Well, a recent study showed that 68% of the foods that people eat and buy in the store have added sugar. We know sugar isn't really a good thing for us. But the question has to be, what is it doing to our thinking? What is it doing to our brains? And this is the question that I think we're now able to answer, but we haven't been looking into nearly enough. What is sugar doing to our brains? Well, sugar fosters inflammation, which listeners know is not good for the body. Chronic inflammation has been implicated in a variety of problems, things like heart disease, things like Alzheimer's disease. What we're understanding now is that inflammation, this process that sugar upregulates, changes our thinking. So let's let that sink in. It's not that it changes our thinking in the long run. It changes our thinking right now. Inflammation has been shown in several recent trials to bias our decision making towards short term impulsive thinking. So to put that into context, if you're eating a diet that increases inflammation, you're going to make more short term oriented decisions like eating a diet that increases inflammation choosing the wrong foods to be eating. And that transcends just diet, it gets into other things. If you're somebody who struggles with online shopping, now you have a diet that increases inflammation, you're going to be picking the short-term reward, and that means your, your shopping cart might be filling up online with things that you don't need. So again, food is one of those entry points. It's something that has been made incredibly palatable over the years, and while that means it might taste good, we need to appreciate that it is activating these circuits within our bodies, within our brains, that are making our decisions more impulsive, more short-term oriented, and in the big picture, taking us away from the decisions that will lead us to health and will lead us to happiness. And let me add, uh, before we move on from food, and uh, because it is, uh, it is a very important topic because we, we recognize that in a simplistic model, there are two areas of the brain that are involved in decision making. The prefrontal cortex, which is the more advanced area, if I may, and the more primitive, if I may, amygdala. And, you know, there's a balance between the two. Uh, we tend to, uh, with inflammation, unfortunately, have more input from the primitive amygdala. And as such, our decisions are not really looking at the future, as opposed to if we can reconnect to the prefrontal cortex, and that is the area of the brain that allows us to in, uh, participate in a process of thinking of the long-term consequences of our actions today. It allows us to be more empathetic. It allows us to be more compassionate. It helps to tamp down this sense of us versus them. That comes from the amygdala. So we're trying to reconnect to the prefrontal cortex. and. You know, as per our discussion of food and inflammation, inflammation absolutely threatens that connection. And I have to say that uh, a thought came to me this morning while in the shower. Some of my best thoughts come to me in the shower. <laughs> and having read the New York Times this morning, they had an interesting article about what's going on in Brazil with reference to deforestation in the Amazon. Not a good thing. I think most people would agree with that. Uh, but that said, what has happened to the uh, thought process around the globe uh, is influenced by the globalization of the Western pro-inflammatory diet. That as this Western diet uh, finds its way to every corner of the globe, it's changing how people across our planet think and behave, locking them more into short-term reward-based decision-making and away from long-term consequence-based thinking and being empathetic towards their neighbor, towards their future selves, towards the planet. So it, uh, our discussion just about food could take us you know, hours and hours, and that would be actually a good thing. But And so in a way, you're almost saying, just to like break it down very clearly, like sugar and other processed foods, which 
you talk to most people and they say, I don't really eat sugar. I'm not eating sugar, but Andrew, it's in our food. It's in everything already. It's already in your pasta sauce and it's already in so many of the health products that you're getting. Even if it's pure cane sugar or other stuff, it's so pervasive that's there. This is encouraging the the factor of inflammation, the cycle of inflammation in the body, and that can even make you more selfish, more it's exactly aggressive. exactly what, what Austin said, and that is that uh, you know it's actively added and this is not a conspiracy theory. We know that the statistics indicate that around 68% of the 1.2 million foods sold in the grocery store have added sweetener. That's, you know, I don't know if we can ever say that's a fact. Somebody may say, no, the world is flat. But it's, you know, if you take the foods and you look at them, you look at the labels, that's what you see. Now, you might not see sugar. You might see a high fructose corn syrup or, uh, you know, people think that, well, maybe it's okay because it's cane sugar or it came from... Uh, organically raised honeybees or or maple syrup that was grown on trees that people prayed around or whatever. It's sugar and it is pro-inflammatory and it is distancing your ability to make good decisions. Mm. You know, this is part of a larger theme that's inside of the book of the new normal that's there. Can you talk to us about the new normal, the new reality that we find ourselves in today? Food is one part of that, but there's a greater topic that's part of that too. Yeah, that's that's such a good point. So where are we at? Where are we at where we're living in the United States today? Well, 70 plus percent of American adults are overweight or obese. 60 plus percent of American adults suffer from a chronic disease. Rates of anxiety are around 18% in American adults. Rates of depression are somewhere around 6% but seem to be increasing in both adults and children. Things don't need to be this way because a lot of these are preventable diseases. And I don't wanna say all of it, but we have these solutions, meaning we know certain diets, for example, the Mediterranean diet is linked to a lower risk of developing depression. We know that exercise is linked to a lower risk of developing depression. We know that we can spend time with other people and that improves our health outcomes, including our mood. So we have kind of these solutions. Now, why that's so important is, as we mentioned before, it's not the question of do we know what to do? It's a question of do we know how to follow through on these things we understand? And so the world as we see it right now could be a lot better with the available information. So much of these things are things that are a result of poor decision making. And again, to give an example, with the sugar. If you're somebody who is, you know that you shouldn't be drinking a whole bunch of soda, you know that you shouldn't be eating a whole bunch of white bread, but you do it anyway, it's not a knowledge problem anymore. It's a problem with being able to follow through on the decisions. And those decisions are a reflection of the way our brains are wired. So to take this to where we wanna go in the book, we need to get upstream. We need to get upstream of the time that you're sitting there looking at the apple and the donut and thinking, I know I should eat the apple, but the donut looks really good. At that point, a lot of the decision has already been made because it's determined by the way your brain is wired. We talk about inflammation. Inflammation changes our decisions. It changes our mood. It changes our entire outlook on life. And as an example of that, we now understand that inflammation may actually cause depression. And I'll take a pause there because it's something that I only recently fully grasped the significance of this, this point. We look at research where they give people either vaccinations or endotoxin, which is a part of a, a bacterial membrane, and it creates symptoms of depression, which means people feel more withdrawn from others. It means they don't want to go socialize. It means they don't enjoy life as much. So inflammation, we, we appreciate it, changes our brain. But again, as I said before, if we know that inflammation is changing our decisions, and we know that our decisions can alter the amount of inflammation in our bodies, then we can get upstream of this by making the choices today, things like exercising, things like meditating, things like even going out into nature for 20 minutes that lowers stress, and when you have lower stress, that lowers inflammation over time. These are ways we can take back our brain for better decisions and better outcomes. You know, uh, I, I was thinking of a couple things as, as we were, as Austin was talking. And uh, the first was, there's a great quote uh, when Luke Skywalker first uh, uh, first meets Yoda. I mean, we get our information wherever we get it, right? <laughs> and Yo uh, Luke is wants to become a Jedi, and uh, he's learning how to use the lightsaber, and he's not doing a really good job. 
and he's uh, Yoda says, "Well, you've got to, you've got to do, do, do not is <laughs> That's do." That's a pretty whatever. good impression, right so, there. So. Uh, he, uh, he says, well, I'm trying. And Yoda says, try. What is try? There is only do and not do. So that's I- interesting. You know, I'm thinking about that in the context of this book, Brainwash. Uh, this is for the people who look in the mirror and say, why is this happening? Why can't I make these decisions? I bought the gym membership. Why am I not going? Why am I not getting the outcome that I want? And I think that the deck is stacked against people and they don't realize it that because of these hacks into their decision making as we've now been talking about with respect to sugar uh, there's many other hacks and, and we'll talk about that but uh, it's it's time that people stop fully blaming themselves and gaining this recognition that their ability to make and stick with better decisions has been taken from them by as we've talked about now sugar via inflammation via disconnection to the prefrontal cortex that's what inflammation does so austin started off first with food david can you pick up on that you were talking about these other hacks what are the other hacks that are there that are hijacking our ability to move forward on the things that we actually care about well so many things and it's you know truthfully many of the lifestyle choices that you've talked about and interviewed people about uh, over the years with reference to their general health i would say that what is thematic about basically everything that we present is the mechanism of inflammation. Yes, the same mechanism underlying chronic degenerative conditions, but now recognizing that chronic inflammation is part of disconnection syndrome, is keeping you from accessing that part of your brain that allows you to plan for the future, make good decisions, stick with your decisions, and even express empathy. That is a powerful threat posed by inflammation brought on, for example, by not getting enough restorative sleep. You know, So in a way, if I could just interrupt, there's all these different streams that are out there, little rivers that then lead into this bigger river. So it could be these not getting enough sleep, not getting enough food or getting the wrong types of food that are there, all going into that main river of inflammation, all contributing to Yes, that. and we're going to revisit that metaphor a little bit later because it allows us to get out of the main river into the smaller tributar- uh, tributaries if we uh, just choose, for example, to change the diet, to pay attention to our exercise, time in nature, relationships, meditation, sleep, etc. So, uh, you know, everybody d- doesn't have to be put off by the idea that, well, I got to jump in a uh, full bore here and do this entire uh, lifestyle change immediately. No. Once you change a couple of these parameters, then the decision making apparatus improves and that will foster making more and more changes. Ultimately, the whole pro- the program is on board and, and people are really finally achieving a place of being satisfied with their decisions and knowing that their decisions are taking them to a better place. Now, we were introducing sleep. You know, we talk about um, how much time do you spend uh, exercising? How much time do you spend meditating? How much time uh, do you spend engaging with other people? Uh, Those time dedications pale in relationship to the amount of time you spend or should spend sleeping. You don't spend a third of your day Uh, eating or exercising unless you're training for some ultra something or other but you spend or should spend about seven or eight hours a third of your 24-hour clock uh, sleeping it's that important and yet we now know that a third of Americans don't get enough sleep don't get adequate sleep and you know it it, it dovetails nicely what Austin was describing earlier in uh, with respect to food Uh, that the same sort of findings are seen when people are not getting enough restorative sleep. Their decision-making apparatus is dysfunctional. They make bad decisions, as an example. uh, People who chronically are not getting enough restorative sleep have an average increased consumption daily of 350 calories added without any added caloric burn. So that's a net 350 more on the scale of where you don't need those calories. And when you consider that 3,500 calories is a pound of body fat, it doesn't take much imagination to think about somebody who's chronically not getting enough sleep over six to eight months to a year, there's going to be a lot of weight gain. And that is a problem because that's fat gain. And there is a powerful association between increasing body fat and worse sleep. 
So that is a feed forward, no pun, well, pun intended, feed forward cycle where you're not sleeping well, you're gaining weight, and guess what? You're not sleeping well. And body fat is pro-inflammatory. And uh, Austin, as he described in the book, tell us about the body fat and, and our appetite, for example. Sure, this is something that was a relatively shocking thing when I finally understood, and that is what do our fat cells do? What do specifically our visceral fat cells do? The fat cells that we find around our belly, for example. And research has shown us that they produce chemicals. What do those chemicals do? Well, they influence our brains. They change the way we think. They change the way we make decisions. So the way I look at this is our adipocytes, our fat cells, they have this agenda. They don't want to be killed off. They want to survive. And how do they do that? Well, they tell our brains, you should be making short-term decisions. And so what we see is that BMI is correlated with higher BMI means more short-term decision-making. So again, thinking about this, your fat cells, they've got their agenda, and that is staying alive, not being destroyed by good decision-making. So they are influencing your brain to tell you, keep doing the things, eating the foods, not exercising, that will keep us going. And they all seem like such small things when you look at them individually. Oh, what's one night's sleep? Oh, right. what's a little bit of sugar? But what you both are really laying out is yeah. the effect that they have on each other. And this is how people get down a downward spi yes, spiral. Yes, it's a great point, Drew. And that is that even one night of uh, whatever it may be, bad decision making, uh, not sleeping, or one day of, of bad eating, uh, in the aggregate, maybe it's not a big deal, but it does tend to set things up. Let's spin that even one week of getting better sleep, even one week of making sure you exercise every day or committing to, as we describe, a 10-day plan where you're going to meditate every day for 10 days, that is, in using your metaphor, a tributary into the, the river, an entree, if you will, to really ultimately allow uh, better decision-making. And it, you know, uh, this discussion about body fat has, another pun, huge implications. Why? You know, as Austin was saying, you know, our, our fat cells seem to have their own agenda. Fat controls the levels of the hunger hormone, uh, ghrelin, which makes us eat more, and therefore we nurture our fatness. And these, it's like cancer cells that increase uh, angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels, and suppress the immune response around the cancer to keep them, they have their agenda, they want to survive, though they kill the host. Uh, with all due respect, fat cells are doing the same thing. They will ultimately kill the host. We know uh, that it's far more than a cosmetic issue, that visceral fat in particular, as, as Austin described, does uh, you know, increase inflammation and as such is associated with chronic degenerative conditions. And that's the number one cause of death on planet Earth. And when we look at each other with the fact floating in the air right now that for the, for the second year in a row, longevity in America is declining. Man, that's, uh, we, we've got we to re redo some things here. We've got to get out some information that transcends giving people just uh, the idea that you need to eat this, don't eat that, and life is going to be good. No, we got to address why it is that they're not making that decision in the first place. I want to come back to something that you said, David, which was you were talking about how when individuals don't get proper night's rest, how it increases their hunger. A lot of people that are listening now, they would think, okay, if I'm not getting a good night's rest, I'm just a little bit more tired. But either one of you, could you explain like what is that mechanism that's actually happening in the body from what we know of so far that would link poor sleep to actually being more hungry the next day? Well, I'd say there are two fundamental mechanisms that we talk about in brainwash, one being the connection between the reward system and the prefrontal cortex, and the other being the connection between a part of the limbic system called the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. And it seems that both are activated in a, a bad way, let's say, by sleep deficit. So we're more likely to choose those short-term rewards because our reward system is changed when we don't get enough sleep. I think we better understand what's going on with the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex with what happens with sleep deficit. And this probably additionally contributes to what we have been talking about, which is why we choose the short-term reward. The amygdala is also linked into that reward circuit. And so what we see is that under conditions of sleep deficit, even as short as one night, 
there is an increased activation of the amygdala in response to threatening images. There's also, in response to a couple of nights of sleep deprivation, less connection between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Now, why does that matter? Well, the amygdala is not a good or bad thing. It's something that has provided us amazing benefit, especially in days gone by and now in the current moment as well. But it's a threat response system. And when we don't get enough sleep, that amygdala is left to fire on its own. We become more sensitive to threats. We're trigger happy. (laughs) Exactly. I I think of it kind of as an alarm system, right? It tells us when something might be going wrong. And the prefrontal cortex has to come over and say, hey, don't worry about it. Things are okay. And maybe adjust the sensitivity. But when that connection between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala is broken down, which is what happens under conditions of sleep deficit, then you have this alarm blaring in the background all the time. Your stress response is constantly going off. When that happens, you increase cortisol, you increase other hormones, and it puts you in a position where you're more likely to make short-term decisions. From an evolutionary perspective, this actually makes sense. When you're under a condition of stress, which in our past would have been more of an acute stress as opposed to a chronic stress, you need to make a quick decision. You don't want to be sitting there thinking about what will the weather look like three days from now. You're thinking about how do I get away from the saber-toothed tiger this moment. But when you're sitting there for hours, for days, for months, and for some people for years, your decision making is going to stay in that short-term focus. And what does that mean? Well, you're going to be making those impulsive decisions like eating those extra calories. The unfortunate thing with sleep deficit is we see this happening after one night. So that one night staying up late, watching Netflix, look, I get it, Netflix is wonderful, but it comes at a cost, and that cost is better decisions. I wanna zoom out for a second and talk about this term that you guys have coined, which is disconnection syndrome, and help us understand what it is and how everything we've talked about fits into the context of this term. Well, a syndrome, by definition, is uh, it constitutes a lot of nuances. So it means we can use this term disconnection syndrome in a very uh, literal way and a very figurative way. In a very literal way, it's exactly what Austin's been talking about, disconnection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, keeping the adult out of the room, basically leaving the kids at home for the weekend with 30 of their closest friends while mom and dad go on a cruise bad idea. We need to have the parents at home to help make the decisions, what to eat, when to go to bed, all the things that happen. That's what we are disconnected from, the ability to make uh, good decisions, to plan for the future, to act compassionately towards other people, to embrace empathy. So in the strictest sense of our application of this new term, disconnection syndrome, that's what we refer to. But in the broader sense, it is a disconnection that is induced upon us because we're disconnecting, for example, from the messaging of our DNA. When we eat fruits that are not um, what our DNA is used to seeing, we increase inflammation, we enhance uh, free radical stress, we compromise detoxification. So we're disconnecting from these pathways in our genome that are set up to keep us healthy. You know, that's sort of one of the fundamentals of the so-called paleo movement, to kind of honor Uh, our paleolithic genome and allow it to express itself. We disconnect from the messaging of our microbiome. We do so by eating foods that are not good for us, taking various medications that are threatening the microbiome. We're disconnecting from these life-sustaining signals and metabolites that our gut bacteria are producing to keep us healthy. Uh, And even more broadly, because of all this happening, because of our disconnection from the prefrontal cortex, then we are disconnecting from each other. We are disconnecting from personal interaction. We are disconnecting from conceiving of the future and disconnecting from our concern over even the health of the planet. So our main mission in uh, Brainwash is reconnection on all of the levels that just were presented. Most importantly, reconnecting to that part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is our gift. You know, that and having an opposable thumb really kind of define us in terms of being different from other animals. I mean, a third of the brain cortex is prefrontal cortex. In uh, in chimpanzees, I think it's 17%. It's a much lower number. So it's not that it's not represented in other primates or other mammals, 
but we've got this incredible ability to plan for the future to make better decisions and uh, you know the the revelation for us that so many aspects of our, our modern life like our digital experiences for example are tending to pull us away from connecting to the prefrontal cortex and locking us into that part of the brain that is far more involved with short-sightedness and narcissism. I really wanted to be very straightforward of looking for what nutrients are most related to the most disabling illness in the world, which is depression. And, and by extension, as depression and anxiety kind of weave together, uh, what can we learn about the most important nutrients? And there, there are 12 of them in the literature that really stand out. Iron is one of them. Zinc is another. Omega-3 fats are another. B12. You know, a lot of nutrients that we hear about. Um, and by strongly uh, related in the science, meaning there's strong correlational data, you don't eat enough iron or you have an anemia, you, you get real significant depression and mood problems and anxiety problems. And then also treatment data that, for example, if you give people an iron supplement, when you treat them with antidepressant, they get better faster. So when we found the nutrients, those 12 nutrients have both of these um, kind of types of data around them. And then we want to, I always want to illustrate, like, what does this do in your brain? Because that's the that's you know that's my business. Brain food is my business. Your brain is what I'm trying to change. And iron is so interesting. One just your brain requires so much oxygen, right? And so part of keeping a healthy vascular system and having healthy red blood cells is the transport of oxygen. The other is that iron is involved in the biochemical pathways that make those brain chemicals lots of people have heard of. Norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, it's a cofactor in those uh, in those chemical reactions. And so I, I like people knowing a little bit around the uh, how these nutrients function in our brain because I think that connection helps us make those choices. You know, you're not just eating fish because some expert says so. You're eating fatty seafood because you have a knowledge about why EPA and DHA, the one chain omega-3 fats, are absolutely vital to healthy, vibrant brains. I just think that empowers people. I mean, that's the point of, of sharing this knowledge, I think, is mental health. Sure, you if you need help from an expert like me, please come. Uh, that's that's what we do. We're good at it. it it's, it's getting treatment in mental health might be hard, but getting people better in mental health settings, I don't think is, is that hard. We have a lot of resources. But I think people really need to reprioritize and, and focus on their mental health and mental fitness and how to really achieve that every day. So high iron foods are part of that, like foods that have these other nutrients are part of that. Yeah. And give us a couple high iron foods, foods that are part of your favorites that you want. Yeah. So my, uh, my high iron side. So, so when I talk about uh, iron, I love, so, you know, one of my favorite high iron foods are clams because clams are also one of the top foods for vitamin B12. They actually are the top vitamin B12 containing food. Um, I love um, some of the plant-based options. Cashews are the nuts with the most iron and nuts are something we're always snacking on in our house. Uh, my wife and I, we've got, we've got a couple of kids, 10 and seven. And so we do a lot of traveling. We're kind of partially nomadic. And so we've always got a bag of, of like raw cashews or raw almonds with us. Um, another surprising high iron food for people are things like liver. One of the reasons that a lot of folks are looking at traditional diets and, and awful meats, you know, organ meats, is just they're very nutrient dense. Um, and then pepitas, pumpkin seeds. That's one of my favorites just because I'm always putting those in, in my pesto, for example, or dropping those in salads. Again, it's a plant-based form. You don't absorb quite as much, but you know, the point is to get a lot of nutrient density and, and you want a mix of plant and animal iron sources. Now you grew up vegetarian, as you mentioned earlier, so did I, uh, I was a very processed food vegetarian, except for the one home cooked meal that I would eat at night at dinner. Um, when my mom was making like healthier Indian food, um, and in the book on the topic of iron and then connected to muscles and seafood, you share about how Seafood, you know, you started le reading the literature on these omega-3 fats and how important they were for the brain and the building blocks of, a, of a, much of the brain, but it was hard for you to come around to actually enjoying seafood. Um, tell us about that story and then what did you actually do? For anybody who knows that seafood is good, but maybe isn't eating enough, what are some tips and tricks from the doctor himself? For sure, and and thank you for that question because I really do try and walk the talk. I don't want anybody to ever eat food they don't like. And, and I think that means really challenging us to expand our palates and understand ourselves as eaters. There's a chapter in the book, Eater, Heal Thyself. I'm really asking people to transcend a lot of the dietary trends and a lot of the kind of quote unquote expert advice. Really think about yourself as an eater. And 
And I had never grown up with seafood. Um, I, I, funny, I remember when we moved to New York City, I had this realization. It's like, oh, I guess, I guess this is a, a town with a lot of seafood because we're by the sea, living on an island. And it's like hadn't struck me, right? Like New York is like pizza. It's like, no, it's a great seafood town. Um, so the data came out. I didn't eat food. I was looking for more protein sources. Um, and so my first, I actually talked, there was a friend we had, uh, Beth, who was um, a chef that was working. She was freelancing for Martha Stewart's team at the time. And we were at a party and I kind of told her about this data and she's like, you should just try a whitefish. I still remember it was like this little apartment in Waverly Place <laughs> down in, uh, um, in the West Village. And she said, you know, put a lot of lemon on there, put a bat of, pat of butter, maybe a little lemon zest. You need to sprinkle some breadcrumbs, slide it under the broiler for like, you know, seven minutes, 10 minutes, see if it flakes apart. I remember being so terrified it was going to be undercooked. Right? This whole like, does it went until it flakes with the fork? It's funny, I've never, ever worried about that since I've become comfortable with seafood. I think it just shows us how our, our fears get in our way, right? Somehow I'm going to mess this up and it's going to like poison everyone. <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> um, so I started experimenting like that. Then I started some really strange things. Like I loved uh, oddly bacalao fritters, salt cod, just in, in, in fish and dipping sauces. And then I realized, you know, I'd always eaten a little seafood. I liked sushi, just a couple things. And so my first steps, and this is our, how we work in our clinic and the brain food clinic is really to think, you know, not that I need to start like grilling seafood and making all these fancy things, but just what's our little things I can do like at a sushi, sushi restaurant. Can I try a new type of seafood? And also, I think a really important challenge for us is, can I ask for help in that, right? Like, hey, I'm, I'm new at seafood and, and is there anything on the menu? I remember I was once in an event and there was a man from Malaysia and we were talking about food and I said something about mackerel, but it was really fishy for me. And he's like, ginger. He's like, we have an amazing dish. You just got to pile as much ginger on there as possible. And I don't know, like uh, got a little mackerel filet and made it with the ginger. And I was like amazed. It was just, it was so great. And so there's all those... I think ways with seafood that there's different forms like ceviche. There are ceviche recipes in both of my last two books because ceviche is a no cook way for seafood, right? If the thing is like, Oh, you don't know how to cook it. Don't cook it, you know, burn it in lime juice, add in some onions, some capers, uh, maybe use pre-cooked shrimp, you know, something. And, and so I think one lesson is start small. Another lesson is, um, you know, uh, take no thank you bites. Like I heard a, a great story from Dr. Suvarma yesterday where she's talking about she didn't like seafood, but her husband did. And so they had a rule that every time they went out, he'd order seafood and she'd try a bite. And, and over the relationship, she's really learned to love seafood. And I just love that story because I think it, it just um, it shows us how our palate develops. Yeah. Maybe the short answer there is. Um, muscles. We love the long answer, by the way. Okay, muscles. Muscles are a great <laughs> thing to try at home. Everyone's scared, but they're amazing. Um, I'd hold off on the big, like the big prize in this, which is the oyster. That's the top animal food on the antidepressant food scale. Um, but those are a little challenging for people because you usually eat them raw and on the half show. You can also do them baked, of course. Um, fish tacos, amazing way to start with seafood. Um, as is ceviche. Those those would be some thoughts. And based on, and you mentioned the anti-depressive uh, food scale, we'll get to that in a second. Um, based on your uh, reading of the literature, like for folks who are like, yeah, okay, cool. I, I want to try seafood or I eat a moderate amount of seafood. What, what is really the, um, the amount that we should be getting in based on what's been, what you've seen out there in the, in the literature to attain some of the benefits of it? So I would challenge people that if you think about seafood really being one of your main protein sources, you know, that, that in most Americans, their main protein source is going to be chicken or beef, you know, uh, that if you can really get seafood in there. So I, I, I in my family, in, in my own diet I'm, and in the book, I'm pushing for three to five seafood meals a week. That can be lox on your bagel. That can be, there's one of my favorite recipes in the book is the dashi. Just because again, I, I try and uh, walk the talk. I just started making this last year. Um, I love ramen. I love noodles. I love that kind of umami healing broth, especially like when I'm anxious or upset, just a bowl of like lots of veggies and maybe a hard boiled egg and some, you know, good buckwheat noodles and some, and I didn't know what that amazing broth is. That amazing broth is dashi. It's made with bonito flakes, which is a fermented dried smoked tuna. And um, I make it with kombu, with seaweed. So it's this really high iodine, delicious broth. Um, so it's an example of one of the things in the book, I think that just, you know, most folks aren't 
making dashi at home. And I started doing that and it became one of the things I just really began to enjoy really throughout the day is something that was really filling, really healthy. So I would encourage people multiple seafood meals, like three to five, and then having your go-to, like in our family, our go-to is a wild salmon. We can make a sheet pan, a wild salmon. We put a little either tartar sauce or special sauce or capers and lemons and kids love it. Um, salmon burgers is another one really easy with canned salmon. Great recipe in the book that that's, you know, once a week, once every 10 days, because kids love it. I uh, try and do an anchovy meal once a week because I think they're really easy and great to use and they're so inexpensive. You know, so much thought about this brain food is like, oh, it's expensive, elitist stuff, all this organic blueberries. And it's like, how about a $199 tin of anchovies? <laughs> and you're going to have the best brain food on the planet. So those would be some of the seafood meals that come to mind of just really trying to rotate those in. I'm also big on wild shrimp just because those are easy, easy for families, easy for kids. Goes on lots of great stuff. Love it. Let's talk about the food scale. So you and your colleague, right. take us on the, on, the, on the story of that and how that came to be and what it is. Yeah, so we, we found these 12 nutrients that, that Drew's asking about. And we said, all right, like, look, let's, let's look at the USDA literature. Let's look at all of the, these um, uh, you know, foods and what are the foods that, that have the most of these 12 nutrients per calorie. And then it's called a nutrient profiling system. At that time, there had been 27 nutrient profiling systems that have been created in the world. The Andy is one a lot of people have seen. Remember Whole Foods used to have that score, like Kale scored a thousand, of course. That was the Andy, the Aggregate Nutrient Density Index. So our scale, the AFS, was the first nutrient profiling system that had ever focused on brain health or mental health. And we tried to make it really straightforward and simple. We just looked at what are the foods that have the most of these nutrients. And uh, we made the list of the most plants and the most animals and, and gave them a score based on you know, how they rated. And then the most important thing in nutrient profiling systems, it's not to emphasize a singular food. You know, uh, even though we all wanna know what's number one, what's number one on the plants is watercress. And most people haven't ever eaten watercress. <laughs> but if you look at what are in the top 10 of the plants, it's leafy greens and rainbow vegetables. You look at what's in the top 10 of the animals, it's bivalves, seafood, uh, and organ meats. And not to say that those are the foods you have to eat to beat depression and anxiety, but those are examples of food categories that we want you to think about how they relate to your life. How often are you eating leafy greens? How often are you eating seafood and bivalves? Well, have you ever made mussels at home or had pasta of angole? Um, and, and that's a way for us all to kind of engage with these very nutrient dense food categories. And, you know, I think the scale, it's helpful because as you go further along in the wellness journey and you are reaching a wider audience, naturally you want to have different inclusion points for them. When people are just first starting, you often, I'm sure, get the question as a doctor, just doc, tell me what to eat, right? I'll do whatever. Just tell me what to eat. So a scale is nice because it gives a starting point for people. And then there's the sophisticated answer, which is like, okay, great. Let's meet you at where you're at because regardless of what your dietary approach is, we can start the inclusion of these things. And it's really about the disclusion of the ultra processed things because it seems like a big message that I'm getting from your book and, and what you talk about overall is like, sometimes it's about what you're not eating as well. Yeah, I think I think the the we're main... not eating frequently. Sorry yeah, to clarify. Exactly. I mean, I think there's a two step dance in this, right? First, just cutting out process. The reason people get better on every type of wellness diet, whether it's keto or carnivore or vegan or vegan, is that they're cutting out processed foods. That that is universally true about all those diets, and it's hard to separate that benefit out from specific benefits. When you have that plus the food SIBO effect. I've joined your dietary tribe, Drew. I think you're amazing. Now I'm following your rules. Of course, I feel amazing. Mm -hmm. those, those, those two things account for a lot of the reasons that people get better on all these dietary plans, right? Fewer processed foods, but you're right. I am recommending that people put specific things in and, and not like a fancy protein powder or a, a supplement or really recommending their foods that contain these nutrients. My last book, Eat Complete, that was really my goal. And it's kind of hard, but of like, can you get all of the nutrients that you need? Can you meet the recommended daily allowance for everything just with food? And you can, but you have to focus on the foods that you know, have a lot of nutrients. There are only a few foods that have EPA and DHA that just fatty fish, algae has a little bit, but it's not concentrated um, and bivalves. That's it. I mean, there's a tiny amount in grass fed beef, but all the other ALA out there is plant-based. Uh, all the other omega-3 is ALA. So 
Um, you asked about what I, foods, I wanted to answer that question. And that's why in this book, I have these, uh, these power players. And the reason was I wanted in to represent the food categories. So, you know, it's not that you have to like kale, but there's a reason that kale is a great representative of the leafy green food category because it's so nutrient dense. It's so versatile. Um, and so I guess controversial in the sense that, I don't know, people are now thinking that maybe kale isn't healthy, which is totally untrue, bad, horrible misinformation that's... I don't even want to start talking about it, Drew. I'm going to get too upset. But these power players, like an anchovy, they 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 they're there to serve as a, a kind of you know not just if you don't eat anchovies, it's fine. You can eat to be a depression, as anxiety, but to serve as a real kind of perfect archetypal example of that food category. So an anchovy, high in omega, 87 milligrams of DHA in one little anchovy. Um, you get a complete protein, B12, calcium, all these nutrients. And then, you know, you get to usually the challenge with people in anchovies, which is they don't, they don't know what to do with them. I didn't, you know, do you get the paste? Do you get them in olive oil? Do you get them in soybean oil? Do you get them in water? And that's where I think people struggle to do something new, especially if we're hungry, especially if we're feeding a family. And that's where I hope the recipes in the book help people of really trying to just make these foods accessible, things like dashi, things like ceviche, um, things like the pesto, where you, you know, no matter where you are on the kind of eater scale, there, there, there are ways that we can improve your nutrient density. And that's the hope of the book. Yeah. And dark chocolate's on the power players. Let's just say that that was purely for food marketing. No, I'm kidding. Dark chocolate has uh, amazing mental health benefits. I mean, in the, in the literature, in the data, and it's one of, I think, a great example of how, as a psychiatrist, I want people to think a little differently about food that I want it to be a joyful and hedonistic experience for you. I don't want dark chocolate to be like your guilty treat you get one day a week because you followed all these rules. That's not how I roll as a psychiatrist and as a, as a food shrink. I want dark chocolate to be part of your daily existence because it's delicious, it's great for your brain, and it's packed with nutrients. What's your favorite dark chocolate? If you want to give a shout out or a plug to any kind of brands that are out I there. A couple. I mean, I've got, I've got like four or five different brands right here with me. I've got, I, I, I you know, I like the hue, um, the cashew uh, butter with a little bit of red. It's like, that's my guilty treat. That's not a solid dark chocolate, but that's just such a good yumminess. I get they the did such a good, good job with that brand. Um, oh, it's, it's so really, amazing. I, I, I was an investor in that brand myself and Dr. Hyman, and they just recently sold. And just the team there, they just did a great job of just getting a, a better for you chocolate. Because I think that another part of this is like, you can enjoy things like dark chocolate, especially... I mean, by nature, we're saying dark chocolate, it's going to not have a lot of other gunk, but still there's naturally greenwashing that happens in the field that's out there. So you can even find dark chocolates that have, they say dark chocolate, but they make that up with a ton of sugar inside. Oh. And now you're not getting the same, the benefits don't translate exactly the same way. Exactly. The way that my favorite uh, dark chocolate is from the La Anita uh, cacao rainforest a kind of farm in Costa Rica. We went down there and I really actually, one of the recipes in the book, the bu uh, buckwheat cacao pancakes is inspired by, I never had cacao nibs and pancakes before. And it totally changed my brunch and, and my life. I mean, I just love cacao nibs, but that's really in terms of palate development. Also, a lot of people listening, if you've been and, and a lot of Drew's listeners probably are, you know, you're off the processed food, but if you, if you're got artificial flavoring, sweeteners, processed foods still creeping into your life, one of the nice things about the whole food journey is, is you develop, a, your palate really develops. And so for me now, like a, a cacao bean, you know, to, to chew on that is, is, is pretty close to dark chocolate in terms of my just experience and enjoyment of it, even though it's, it's just the bean. Um, so yeah, but dark chocolate is, is a, I think a good example of a really nutrient dense food, lots of fiber, uh, lots of magnesium, iron, but also, uh, you know, a food that, people aren't oriented towards in a way that it's anything other than, you know, I don't know, like the not healthy version or the not fun, what Seth Rogen called it, the not fun version of milk chocolate. I was like, that's so not true. It's, it's like so much more dopamine you get from the dark chocolate. I know. I know. Dark chocolate is amazing. Um, let's take a step back. What is it specifically that made watercress score so high and be number one on the list? And then how is that something that you're integrating into your uh, diet if you are? Yeah, so watercress scored high is all leafy greens do because they just don't have any calories. So a cup of kale has 33 calories and a cup of watercress has less than that. And so when you have so few calories, that's why you're gonna top 
any nutrition you bring to the table, you're going to top out these nutrient density uh, scales. Watercress, I've incorporated in my diet because it's a, le it's a leafy green that I never ate before at all. It's very spicy. I do a lot of arugula. And then one of the fun things about this, this kind of work is how much you get to learn about food. And so I didn't know that watercress, for example, is a big part of a Haitian diet. And people in Haiti eat water. I met a woman from Haiti who said, oh, we, we eat watercress almost every day in Haiti. And I had no idea. So, so that kind of led me into being curious about this food. And, and I can't find it that much. I always think it's a little blessing from the universe. I did, um, uh, with, I did an interview with our friend, Dr. Rupi, the doctor's kitchen. And I yeah. was out in Wyoming and I'm like looking for stuff to make pesto with. I can't find this. Camera. And there's this giant display of watercress. And so, you know, sometimes it shows up in my life and I try and it's one of those ones I'm working on though. It's a little bit of a challenging one. Yeah. Sometimes Asian stores, if you go to like the traditional sort of Asian markets, if you live in a bigger city and have access to it, you can find some over there. Well, since you brought up the kale thing, I feel like some of the people listening who are not in the know of why people would be, you know, uh, not to name any names, but why people would be poo-pooing kale. I think it's worth talking about at least in the context of helping people understand the lay of the land and providing them with good information. So I want to first start off by saying I was actually a raw foodist for like a couple of years. I did like a hundred percent raw food diet back in the day. And kale was like a huge portion of what we ate. So I think I've, I'm so turned off by kale, not because I don't believe the Over literature there. on it. <laughs> I just ate kale every day for probably a good three, four years, at least, you know, for lunch and dinner. And, um, you know, some of the conversations that are becoming a little bit more popular in some of the dietary movements are the discussions around, yes, there's nutrients and there's also anti-nutrients that certain foods have. And, and give us a little bit of that. Uh, with that context, tell us about why, why would it be that some people would maybe say that kale is not this great food that we're talking about just so that our audience can understand what you were referencing earlier? I think the main motivations to me seem to be bullying and marketing and spreading of misinformation to get clicks. And it's, it's, it's had me really upset, to be honest, Drew. Um, so I, I, I think I can tell you where the story started from, because the story began as a uh, <clears throat> getting emotional here. You can tell how much kale means to me. It, it bothers me because we launched National Kale Day. It was years ago after Fifty Shades of Kale came out. And, Which is uh, one of your books. Yeah, one of my books. And, and we wanted to do something to sort of help, you know, a lot of people get exposure to kale. And, uh, and uh, so we focused on schools, we focused on the military, um, we partnered with like large school districts just to like serve kale on National Kale Day. And so LA County decided to serve kale for the first time. Every single public school in LA County was going to serve kale on National Kale Day. It's part of their efforts to include five superfoods in the menu for all the kids. And so like three or four days before this, I get a call from a journalist saying that he's breaking a story about a scientist who's discovered that kale is toxic. And, and got to imagine my position here. We've been like really working hard behind the scenes to, to get thousands of people, kids eating healthy food. And then suddenly it's this, you know, there's this like, uh, oh, news, like kale's radioactive, kale's absorbing thallium. Then there was a story in the Times that came out. It's like, was it kale trouble, kale juicing trouble ahead? And it was a unfact checked story about a woman who'd been drinking kale juice and her dentist said her cavities were caused by it. Now, I mean, I, I guess cavities can get ca caused by any juice, but you know, it's a little. And then those kind of pieces of information began to um, uh, kind of lead to what we called kale backlash. And, and this is having been, a, I guess, a victim of bullying in my life. You know, it, it, it's pretty easy for me to spot when it happens, when people are, well, they, they're, uh, they're wanting to kind of tear things down. And, uh, and so it's just a little strange to see um, th this thing that, you know, is a healthy food. Anything that's nutrient dense is really good at bioconcentrating. If it's a fish, if it's a mussel, if it's a kale plant, that organism's job is to extract things from its environment and bioconcentrate them. So if you grow fish in lots of microplastics and mercury and dirtiest water, it's not going to be healthy. It's going to concentrate those things. And the same thing with kale. 
Uh, and so the, the anti-nutrient movement, I also have not seen evidence that that is relevant to human health. And maybe I'm not informed in that, but I've looked pretty hard. And I think if you look at things, um, uh, uh, you know, like lectins, well, lectins basically disappear when you cook food and things like beans, well, you always cook them and boil them at pretty high temperatures, which gets rid of them. When you hear rumors like, oh, kale oxalates, you know, actually kale is the definition of a low oxalate green. So when I see stuff like that, it, it, it really uh, bothers me because, and I think it's because I'm a clinician, Drew. So you just sit with people where the misinformation hurts their health. And I think that much like COVID exposed how selfish can people be, especially when there's not a direct correlation. Right? There was no accountability if you gave somebody COVID or not. And it just was pretty rare. Nobody really know where you got it from. So there's not really accountability for anybody, especially a lot of wellness influencers of just kind of saying whatever they want. And, and I think when you're a physician you're, or a health coach or a clinician where you see people what happens? You know, I see what happens when people get taken off of the, all their meds and put on a, a strange diet, or I see what happens when people get put on lots of supplements instead of having a psychotherapy. Um, or you see when people come in just scared, you know, they're just scared because they've heard all this garbage that's designed to scare people. So I think that's, that's where uh, it hits a real personal note with me. I've just, I don't know. I've been around bullies in my life. I've been bullied in my life. And I just, I don't know, I saw an interview recently between a couple of interviewers and it's just, it just felt like bullying, you know? It's like, when are we gonna like wake up? When are we gonna be woke and stop judging and bullying one another about our beliefs and start encouraging one another to live healthy? So that's well, my favorite. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you uh, spoke up about it because I think it's important for, again, if you're listening to this podcast, I know there are some new people and welcome to those folks. If you aren't familiar with, Drew Ramsey, you got to follow him on Instagram. He's putting out a lot of great content and get his new book, um, Eat to Beat Depression, Anxiety. Check out some of our other interviews as well. But for the folks that have been listening for a while, they're walking down the sophisticated pathway of having a good sense, you know, and we all eat some level of processed foods, even if it's healthy processed foods, right? There's healthy processed foods that we're all eating. Um, the whole, there's a whole new marketing push of healthy processed foods that are grown in the lab, yeah. right? Like and, what? What are we supposed to feel about that? And, you know, that they're, they're, we're all doing the best that we can. And I think it's good to have the discussions around things because really the larger message, one of my, one of my favorite interviews that we've done in the past is that is a dear buddy of mine from the New York Times. His name is um, Anahat O'Connor. And he wrote a diet, he wrote an article called, um, I'm going to paraphrase the title, uh, but people can Google it if they type in Anahat O'Connor, New York Times. He said, basically, is there a perfect diet? Right. I remember this article. I, I know his his work well. I love he uh, he wrote a recent article. Um, I was going to message him to say he should include mental health. It was all about physical health. But yeah, well, shoot me a note and I can I can connect you guys together. He does some really great work and a very balanced guy. And and like you and me, he's been through a lot of sort of a, he grew up in sort of a a more like very spiritual family. And for them, that meant like being vegetarian. And then later on in life, kind of like your journey, my journey, he switched to a different, you know, direction. So he's also just seen, um, you know, he's been through a lot of different stuff and he strongly believed one thing and another thing. And that typically leads to people who are a little bit more balanced in their approach, you know, they knew how passionate they were about one topic so they can understand why other people would be passionate about that now. Anyways, I digress. The article basically, for those that have not seen it, was, is there a perfect diet and what can modern day hunter-gatherer society tell us? Like, is there an ideal diet for human beings? And when we look at modern day hunter-gatherer societies, we see that they all eat different levels and percentage of macros. Some of them eat a lot, lot more vegetables that are there and don't eat very, they don't eat much plant food, uh, sorry, meat or seafood. Definitely a lot of seafood, but less meat. And then some are eating exclusively that. Some are drinking milk is the primary way that they get their calories. Um, I've talked about it in the past, but there's this tribe in uh, Africa called the Samburu. They're, they're cousins of the Maasai. I got to go visit them a few years ago. They primarily get 90% of their calories from drinking milk from these grass-fed cows that they have. And they've been living this way for you know a thousand plus years. But the, the larger message, which I see in your work and your themes is that we've seen that people have had a breakdown of eating a lot of different ways. The human body is so resilient. We can eat a lot of different things and we shouldn't really be putting any one food 
on the pedestal. I'm talking about whole foods here. And that also means that we really shouldn't be putting any one food on the opposite of whatever a pedestal is, the chopping block, the guillotine. That that doesn't make any sense because the themes from these groups are a lot of different things work for different people. But the key is whatever diet they're eating, they're getting diversity from that diet and they're eating a lot of different stuff regardless of what diet they're eating. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, it's, um, it reminds me of a phrase that I'm a little scared of, that sort of everything in moderation, because I don't really think that's true anymore. I think that's been used as an excuse for processed foods to really, really creep in. But I love the point you make because I think it's essential nutritional psychiatry. The human body is really walking around to do one thing, which is nourish and feed our brain. And that's one of the reasons your brain feels compelled to kind of go after almost anything sometimes, especially sweet things, is because it's thinking, it's not thinking, ooh, cookie, bad for me. It's thinking, mm, cookie, I'm going to burn that maybe in two weeks when I can't find any cookies. And, and so uh, we really can survive on a large number, a large, a different mixes of macros, different uh, mixes of food groups. Uh, I think what the new book, Eat to Beat Depression and Anxiety, really tries to do is ask people to kind of elevate or transcend this diet culture that's that that's really emerged in the wellness world, right? Of it's kind of like politics now. It's basically competing factions of people screaming at each other. And if you're a part of that, I don't think you're part of the solution anymore. I think it that's a, there's a lot of primitive projection that goes on. And what is better is for us to really look inwardly on what foods are working for us, what foods can help us better hone and refine our values and what foods can help us be in the world in a way that supports our connections, our mental health, our creativity. That's really what, um, what I hope this book achieves and helps people with. What are some of the most common examples of issues or symptoms that people come into your clinic with who are suffering from either mold or this broader spectrum of toxic household soup? Mm -hmm. So um, you know, one very com uh, you know, common set of symptoms are fatigue just really, you know, profound fatigue that's uh, oftentimes can be physical, but more frequently is just mental fatigue, you know, cannot get through the whole day without taking a nap. Um, and, um, and, and they don't know why. Another is uh, really profound anxiety. You know, we have patients who come in who've been seen by, you know, multiple psychiatrists or had a, a a couple come in uh, a couple months ago that both had been given a diagnosis of bipolar uh, disorder and put on five or six psychiatric medications uh, when most of their psychiatric symptoms disappeared within three weeks of moving out of the moldy environment. So um, a number of sort of uh, uh, anxiety and emotional symptoms are, uh, are present. Uh, a number of, you know, um, muscle and skin symptoms, including sometimes, uh, you know, skin symptoms that can be, you know, burning, uh, paresthesias or tingling in the arms and legs. Um, there can be uh, problems with blurry vision, where in particular, because uh, patients can't oftentimes distinguish between uh, gray and white contrast, They'll, they'll go to the ophthalmologist and be told, I have problems with uh, my vision. And the ophthalmologist will test them and say, hey, you have a 20-20 vision. There's nothing wrong with your eyes. But when we test them with uh, a visual contrast sensitivity test, they cannot tell the difference between uh, gray and white very easily. And then there are um, you know, some additional uh, symptoms like urination, where patients are going to uh, um, uh, the bathroom a dozen times or, or more a day. And that's usually caused because uh, hormones that control urination are, are diminished. And uh, an interesting symptom is uh, static shocks when you touch a, a doorknob. 
And that's usually caused because there's some problems with uh, salt and water balance and uh, you create a little bit of an electrical gradient. And so that's, uh, that's a very classic symptom for mold. Wow. So, so if somebody's getting shocked all the time, wherever they go and they're opening up doorknobs, that's a reason to pay attention to this category? That, that, that's correct. They're not just part of a Marvel movie, but it could be, uh, it could be something <laughs> with mold. Wow. Take us through the, what's happening on a biological level that mold and this toxic soup of environmental toxins can be wreaking havoc on our body through all these different ways that you just shared. Yeah. So, um, the, the biology can get very complicated and there's, um, and I think one of the most exciting things that's happening is the, the research is really going down to the level of people's genes and how genes are getting turned on and off. But there are, you know, four or five, I think, critical points about what's happening in the body. Now, I think the first is that there are a set of people who have genomic susceptibility, meaning that um, I think there's likely a, you know, multiple genes that affect their ability to be um, sensitive to mold. And very likely those genes uh, are along the pathways of how people detoxify. Uh, what you see is a ineffective immune response, a inflammatory response, and ultimately a problem with the mitochondria. And so that the uh, their mold is likely a trigger for this inflammation and response, and whether it's called sort of the cell danger response, Dr. Shoemaker has put a very, you know, uh, a specific set of pathways together uh, around what happens with mold. Uh, but you get this ineffective response that's very difficult for the body to turn off. Um, it affects the brain, and in particular, it affects the hypothalamus and the pituitary so that there are reduced hormones that ultimately uh, prevent the response from being turned off. And then um, the mitochondria themselves lead to uh, problems with energy and problems with brain functioning. And um, ultimately that can create neuroinflammation, but um, we will see in older patients, um, you know, significant atrophy over time. You mentioned older patients. We've had Dr. Bredesen on the program and you were instrumental in sort of that a uh, group of early case studies that were being done using the Bredesen protocol to treat uh, cognitive de decline. Tell us the relationship between uh, mold, cognitive decline, and 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 Alzheimer's, as you were talking about with um, patients, and some of the findings that you and the team at at the Bredesen uh, protocol have have found about the connection between mold and and cognitive decline. Yeah, and so um, you know, Dr. Bredesen has been, you know, pioneering in um, articulating a root cause approach to cognitive decline. That uh, you know, his core uh, hypothesis is that we have to look at a number of uh, different uh, root causes that can cause something called amyloid precursor protein to either turn off or turn off. And um, you know, there's a bit of a balance. And so ideally when patients are healthy, uh, the, the seesaw is sort of tipped towards the balance where the body is able to create connections and synapses. And then when there's a tip the other way, um, it can destroy synapses. Uh, and uh, when we look at all of the different root causes, and let's say um, there's a, um, a good uh, certified Bredesen practitioner who's taking patients through the protocol. Um, there's usually two major reasons now why people won't have success. You know, the first reason is um, just not adhering to the protocol. It may be just too difficult for somebody. 
But the second is um, the whole uh, host of toxins, what Dale calls, calls type three or you know, toxic Alzheimer's. And um, within that, there can be a combination of mold, chemicals, heavy metals, or infections. Uh, usually when we go down and look at these issues, there's usually not just one uh, you know, root cause, there ends up being a couple. And it's really hard for the brain to start to repair itself until there can be removal of toxins and the related inflammation out of the system. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that can be very hard for patients to do because when you're looking at some of these issues with uh, environmental illness, um, the hardest step to take is the first step, which is addressing the environment. And, uh, and that can be a very large barrier for, for, for patients. And so, you know, just to kind of put it all together, um, toxin exposures, uh, Dale thinks has been about between 50 to 60% of people with Alzheimer's have significant amount of toxin exposures. We find the same in, uh, in, in South Florida and probably the number two reason why patients aren't getting better on the protocol is there's not a sufficient addressing of the toxins. Take the home and give us the big picture of of where the most common areas, you know, you're, you're a physician and you're treating patients and you're helping them better with mold, but in a way you've had to become a little bit of an expert in sort of buildings, at least understanding where people are getting uh, this toxic soup from in the first place, whether it be mold or some of the other components. So kind of walk us through the house a little bit and tell us why is it that the home is poisoning so many folks and where would they find these, uh, these toxins. Yeah. So, um, you know, Drew, I, I, I remember actually the um, time where um, we decided as a company where we really wanted to go deep into mold. And uh, it was at the time of Hurricane Irma and, uh, and uh, myself and my partner needed to be, you know, we needed to leave um, our house for about a week, uh, you know, with the, with the family and uh, go up to Orlando because uh, they just had done a general evacuation of, uh, of, of South Florida um, uh, because of Irma. And, uh, you know, when you're in a hurricane for, uh, and uh, surrounding bad weather for a couple of days, uh, it's just sort of the realization hit us that if you look at that, that this is a very preventable and uh, foreseeable problem. And there are fundamental issues with how we build houses today that you can predict that maybe 30, 40% of houses, certainly in South Florida, will get mold problems if we continue the same type of construction. And, um, and some of those construction flaws are, I think number one, having bad drywall. Uh, drywall, the way that most people purchase drywall is just a breeding ground, a petri dish for mold. And so if any of drywall gets wet and is not dried out uh, you know, quickly in a, a day or two, um, it will become uh, a place in which uh, either mold or actinomyces can grow. And, um, and sometimes, unfortunately for homeowners, that might be a leak that you don't even see. It could be a leak, uh, you know, in the shower uh, behind the tile, or it could be a leak uh, in the dishwasher, you know, hidden be uh, behind the cabinets. Or if there's uh, water damage, it can be coming, you know, from uh, from a window um, from a windowsill. So any place where there's ongoing humidity and heat and drywall can absolutely be a place in which uh, mold can grow. Now, the other thing is um, in the tropics uh, here, uh, there can be an issue with uh, humidity and how humidity is managed. Uh, we see that houses will do much better uh, in the tropics with having positive pressure where the air uh, 
when you open a door, the air pressure actually pushes air outside of the house rather than in. Um, and then the air conditioning unit can be a huge source of mold and particle exposures. And so we get often stories where uh, patients haven't uh, addressed their air conditioner for you know five or ten years, and you look at the coils and they're you know they're covered with they're they're covered with mold. Um, going further up north, basements are a common uh, you know a focus for uh, water damage and problems and. You know, oftentimes there'll be you know great finished basements where the kids are playing, or it's a it's a it's a big great room, and there'll be you know hidden water damage uh, you know behind there. So pretty much anything in which there can be water damage, and then there can be substances that that bacteria and mold can feed on, um, are are sources. Now, I want to chat a little bit about sort of. Diagnose, like diagnosing and discovering that somebody's dealing with the mold issue, right? You talked about these unexplained symptoms, and I know at your clinic, you know, you guys spend uh, a couple hours with people going through their whole timeline, not just for mold, but just any kind of thing that they're dealing with in their in their life. When you start to get into the brass tacks of actually seeing is there mold present that's impacting somebody, how do you begin the process of? using either laboratory or other techniques to discover that mold seems to be present? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think first as a, as a clinician, I think it, there's just in, important to have awareness of it. And I've had, uh, uh, you know, several very fruitful conversations with uh, patients, primary care physicians, where, uh, you know, they were wondering why patients had um, these these symptoms and uh, and and they became aware of you know mold illness um, and I think once you become aware of it and uh, and and see a couple cases it does really uh, you know it's like going through the rabbit hole you you realize how much um, it's likely that environmental illness does contribute to um, patient symptoms but uh, with the house I think it's really critical. Um, to um, to have the right type of assessment, and uh, let's let's just take a case in which there's really high suspicion of of mold. Um, I think it's important to have a trained indoor environmental assessment professional on site to um, look. And that's really because I've gotten a, an appreciation that building biology and the whole work that IEP professionals do is very similar to medicine, where there's not a perfect test. You know, everybody kind of tries to uh, distill it to saying, okay, is this one test better or this test better? And the answer is no, we actually have to get a lot of different information. We need to understand, you know, uh, the construction and the age of the house. We need to look for signs of, of, of water damage. We then, uh, you know, measure certain types of tests depending on the specific situation. And then we kind of put it all together. And that's really similar to what doctors do. They're just, uh, you know, in some ways sort of uh, building doctors. And uh, I think we are uh, one of the only practices where we've developed an indoor environmental professional group as part of the practice because we felt here in South Florida to get the right answer was just critical. And, uh, and so um, we now have certified professionals as part of that. Uh, but really getting somebody on site is important because the I think one of the biggest insights in the last year has been that maybe the biggest issue in the house is not mold. It's actually, you know, bacteria and endotoxin and actinomyces. And uh, Dr. Shoemaker has, has done some very interesting research that was published uh, this last month. Uh, that showed that when you looked at some very sophisticated transcriptomics uh, testing to see what was causing inflammation, and then you did sophisticated testing in the house, uh, you know, more times than not, the answer was it was bacteria rather than mold. And so some of the mistakes that we see happen out in the industry is 
people just get an air sample. And if the air sample is negative, they're, they're told uh, it's fine with uh, uh, in terms of mold, or they might put a Petri dish out and just uh, look for spores. Uh, but the bottom line with most patients is your body doesn't really care if the mold is alive or if it's a spore. If there's any kind of toxic soup or schmutz or whatever you want to call it, that uh, you're, you're inhaling um, uh, uh, fragments and, um, and that's enough to cause inflammation. And so um, if there's a high suspicion we really think it's critical to get the right type of uh, indoor environmental professional in the house. And uh, a um, clear mistake can be for somebody to just rely on a home test. Now, obviously not everybody can get an IEP um, there. And if, if that's the case, there are ways to get, uh, you know, some uh, more accurate testing than not. And, uh, could you, do, could you share what IP stands for? Yeah, IEP is uh, Indoor Environmental Professional. Got it. So it's a little bit of a higher certification when it comes to uh, indoor toxins and, and the ability to discover that rather than just having, uh, you know, often when people are going to buy a new home or inspecting a place, mm -hmm. there'll be a home inspector who just will sign off and say, okay, there's no visible mold that we see here. So mold is not an issue. But uh, this individual that you mentioned is going to be going a lot deeper. Is that how it works? Yeah, I think that um, there really are sort of some different sets of regulations. You know, the most common set of regulations are just around real estate standards, you know, buying and selling a home. And, um, and I think that uh, patients need to get an IEP that um, is sensitive to health standards, that they know that if... Uh, patients have a mold sensitivity, the standards just need to be higher than the, than the real estate standards. And, uh, you know, what we find in, in, uh, in many cases is um, a lot of the testing um, that can get done in the real estate standards are a little bit biased towards just uh, showing that there's not a huge problem. Um, and I think most patients want to know, is there any problem? And, uh, and so they, that they need a help of a qualified IEP to, to get there. Yeah. I often think about it as, um, you know, home inspectors are often, you know, requested upon by real estate agents. Right. Yeah. And the thing is, is that if you're an inspector who keeps on finding problems with 30 to 40% of buildings having mold, not just in South Florida, but you know, in North America as a whole, you're not going to get future business. Cause they're like, that's the guy or that's the girl that keeps on finding the problems. And that's why it's so important that if you are an individual that's buying a new home, you need to have somebody that advocates on your behalf that you've picked because, you know, I was saving this for a little bit later in the conversation, but this seems like a good period of time. We can always jump around a little bit, sure. but once you move into a home, especially if you bought that home and there is um, a toxic soup problem, including maybe bacteria, but definitely mold is remediation can be one of the most difficult things that you do repairing that process, especially when you have it in the drywall, that might be the whole kitchen, you know, and you've already moved into a house, you'll spend, you could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on remediation and still not end up at a place where you're completely sure if the if the home is habitable for you. Any thoughts on that that you want to expand on? Yeah, I I, I love the way that you've uh, framed the issue um, because I think this has been a situation in which my view has really changed a lot over the last uh, you know two or three years. You know, I used to think that if you had a problem in the house. Of course, it could get fixed. And um, I think that for many patients, the best answer may be to move out of the house rather than to fix it. And so um, that's, that's really the headline. And, and why, do, why do I say that? Well, I think that um, there, there's, there's a couple reasons why moving out might be better. 
as if there is extensive mold damage. Um, we're finding that the building biologies are not dissimilar to the microbiome in the, in the human body, meaning that we'd like to be able to adjust it, but it may not be as easy to adjust as we, as we think. So it's sometimes not as easy as just saying, we're going to get rid of the issues and, and, and fix it. Uh, uh, some, uh, some very detailed uh, studies done in Japan have kind of shown that it's harder to move uh, the, uh, the building microbiome than, um, than, than we think. But the second is, is that especially in patients who are really sensitive, there is a lot of trauma that can happen with when the remediation doesn't get done right the first time. And uh, I think there can be a lot of damage done uh, that gets in the way of healing in terms of multiple levels uh, at multiple times of remediation. And when we find that there are big issues, unfortunately, that's oftentimes the case. And what we've started to do with patients is to have that discussion up front uh, much more than, than we used to about, is it just better to fix it for a real estate standard? Uh, obviously, you're going to uh, be ethical and you're going to disclose, but uh, the, the real estate standards, I think, are quite different than the, than the health standards. Um, and then just find a, a better place to move to. Um, and I do think also with patients with Alzheimer's who might not have any physical symptoms from the mold, then it becomes, uh, you know, that's quite a bit of a different situation than patients who have physical symptoms because sometimes those physical symptoms will come back when they're in the house and at least that's a safety and protective mechanism and that's not present in, in, in um, patients who have early Alzheimer's. And so I think there is a lot of situations now where it's important to get the right information up front and before pouring a lot of money into extensive remediation, um, you know, to have an honest conversation about, is it just better to move? And, um, and then finally, there are situations where you may not ever be able to fix the problem. And so what would that be? You know, for example, if um, you're in a condominium complex where uh, the governance is from a homeowners association, um, there's just a logical um, you know, awareness that the HOA board is not gonna have the same kind of uh, urgency to fix the entire building that a um, you know, occupant of a condo might. And so sometimes there are, you know, common areas like hallways and entrances that just never do get fixed. And if those are really causing a problem for patients, uh, almost in all cases, we'll just say it's better to, you know, move out. So. What about what, testing when it comes to the individual and, and looking for mold or mycotoxins that are present inside of their body. There, there's so many different, as you mentioned earlier, there's no perfect test that's there, but what is the sort of, okay, if, if I, I'll typically do this test, this test, this test, and these are the things that I'm looking for. So um, maybe you can explain what mycotoxins are and then how you approach from all the gathering of the data of looking for the presence of this environmental soup and mold inside of the body. Yeah. So. Um... So for, uh, mycotoxins are uh, toxins that are released uh, by mold. Uh, there tend to be about, you know, uh, dozens of, uh, of, of different mycotoxins that can now be commercially tested. And, uh, you know, mycotoxins can get in the body probably through, uh, you know, multiple different mechanisms, you know, inhaling uh, mold or, or fragments, uh, you can ingest mycotoxins. Uh, there's a whole deep uh, literature in the veterinary um, side of animal illnesses that are caused by uh, uh, grains that are poisoned with mycotoxins. And, um, and there's a, you know, a lot of controversy right now about the use of, of urinary mycotoxins to measure and manage uh, mold. Um, I think first we need to understand that if bacteria and 
actinomyces and endotoxins are causing all of this inflammation, that first of all, if you do urinary mycotoxin tests, you're not going to measure any of that. Um, and so there's going to, the, you know, the Shoemaker paper argues that it's over 50%. I think we need additional um, research to figure out how much it really is, but I think it's an important insight that, um, that if you're just looking for mold, you're going to miss uh, a significant amount of cases. And we have to have additional research to figure out the, the exact numbers. Um, but with it, so, so you're going to miss that with mycotoxins. Um, the second thing is, is that if you're looking at testing, what is causing the, the, the problem? And in general, the biggest issues are around the inflammation and what's happening in the, in the brain. And so if we have a budget, I would prioritize some of that, those tests uh, over that. Um, I do uh, use urinary mycotoxins in a couple of cases, and that's, I think, primarily when there's, there's a logic there around patients wanting to see that there's mold in their system. And if I believe that that will help to convince them to take action, you know, I'll oftentimes do that. But it is lower on my set of testing rather than higher. Because what I will oftentimes see is, you know, for example, in South Florida, there's a lot of mold in, um, in the air outside because we're part, of, you know, because of the Everglades and just the, the humidity. And so I suspect if you did uh, mycotoxin testing on 100 patients with no health problems, uh, that you'd, you'd see most of them have uh, okra toxins that are elevated. Um, and uh, I haven't seen the, the research around that, that that hasn't been published to, to my knowledge, but I've seen enough people who are friends of patients who were worried about them having, you know, uh, worried about themselves having mold and really didn't have symptoms and they come in with an isolated high uh, okra toxin. And so I think as any test, we have to really understand that there's false positives and false negatives. And uh, I think the mycotoxins have to be read the right way. So uh, when you were talking about the um, looking for the inflammation inside the body, so can you talk about some of those tests that are there? Yeah. And so the, um, the inflammatory markers, um, there, many of them are connected to the innate immune system, uh, which is kind of the, the body's most uh, primitive uh, immune system. And many of those, those markers are um, signs that that immune system has been activated. And so, for example, C4A, um, which usually should be done by National Jewish uh, Center Labs, uh, if it's elevated, oftentimes is a good uh, marker that things are going on in the brain. Uh, TGF beta um, is a marker that can be elevated in mole, but also can be elevated in other infections and cancer, so it's nonspecific. Uh, MMP9 is a, is a marker that when it's elevated, we oftentimes think about histamine and mast cell issues as well. Um, and then VEGF is oftentimes low, and that's, the, and that's a um, cytokine that actually decreases perfusion in the body. And when VEGF is low, we oftentimes see poor blood flow to the brain and you can see poor blood flow to the uh, hands and feet as well. So those are a couple of uh, inflammatory markers. I think the important thing to understand with um, all of those markers is that uh, none of them are, you know, uh, sort of perfect gold standard markers and that if it's elevated, it's only mold. There are other things that can elevate it, but they're extremely useful to put together the whole clinical picture. Exactly. And I think that's the, the key with your approach. And, um, you know, some of your other colleagues that are also in the space is that you're trying to put together the best possible story, which also includes looking at the home or the apartment that the individual might be living in or the family. And then also their symptoms, when their symptoms started, the timeline of those symptoms. Um, and then, you know, the clinical testing that you can do on that side. And it's the, it's the combination of those all where then 
hopefully you can have a really strong hunch that mold and this toxic soup could be a challenge that then could be uh, addressed. Once, let's say there is, you know, some discovery of some mold that's there. And just a reminder for everybody that's listening, um, it's, it's often, you know, you have to lift up the, the panels under the sink or it's behind the shower. Like these are not very visible things, especially if somebody lived in the house before you and there was early signs of mold. Like we're all very good at getting rid of a visible mold in most cases, right? But right. it's the, the hidden mold that's behind things that then in a weird way is it's the perfect breeding ground for mold and bacteria because we've protected it from the natural elements, sun, and these other things that would make it more difficult for mold to grow at the level that it's growing in when it's in this dark, cool area that also has exposure to moisture. It's like the perfect feeding grounds. So let's say, um, you know, all those things are present. There's mold that's present in the house. There's some neuroinflammation and some signs of, of clinical information. The patient's timeline starts up. What everybody's a little bit different, but in your head, if you could compartmentalize your approach, how do you begin the process of untangling from there? Yeah. So, um, I think the, the most important part of the, um, approach is to get them patients into a clean environment. And, um, and so, um, if it's possible, let's say there's an issue with, uh, you know, that there, there could be a long remediation, you know, trying to just get the patient out of the house, uh, completely for a couple of weeks can oftentimes be a, uh, a, an immediate value because patients will see their symptoms go away, you know, not maybe not completely, but they'll see that it's resolved with being removed from exposure. And I think it's really important that, that patients can see that. Um, can I ask a quick question about that? Sure. Do you, um, Will you use that sometimes as like almost like a challenge test for them to like, Hey, look, go away for two weeks out of your current place. And like, do you notice your symptoms reducing or have you ever gone on vacation away from a few weeks in the past and you found that you've been better for a little bit and you came back and you didn't feel as good? Um, abs absolutely. That can be used as, uh, as, a, as a diagnostic uh, challenge. You know, I had a patient who uh, has, uh, has Parkinson's where um, when they went uh, from Miami to Colorado uh, for a month, their hair actually changed from gray to black. You know, and and sort of that kind of a profound change in terms of uh, differences uh, with exposure. So you don't usually get such, uh, you know, that that clear of a signal. Uh, but if if that can be arranged, that that's that's ideal. You know, one of the challenges just becomes, okay, well, how do you know that the whatever place that you're going to is completely safe and uh, and, and and that? But I think getting out of the environment is is absolutely critical and that's really the the first part of any protocol and um and so um having that conversation with 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 patients and just really getting alignment around that is um is i think the the most challenging part of, of taking care of patients here because uh you know there's a lot of uh, um, uh, immediate sort of pain and trauma that there can be with uh, leaving the home or even thinking that uh, that the home is the cause of, of of their symptoms and there's uh you know oftentimes uh it takes people quite a bit of time to uh to uh um, get their uh head wrapped around that you made the choice of exploring meditation oh yeah Tell us about how you encountered it and what some of your early experiences were like. Wow. Well, uh, talk about looking at the world through the eyes of other people. Um, I grew up in a decent kind of middle, lower middle class home, suburbs of Los Angeles, I raised as a casual Methodist. Uh, and then I went off to UCLA, a time of great ferment, learned a little bit about psychology, but it seemed really boring because it seemed like 
running mat, rats through mazes. So I got into the human potential movement, even in, in college. Uh, but still, it was fairly very Western. And then at the end of college, I thought, oh, I ought to learn more about Eastern cultures and religions and practices. So um, I dove into that uh, on a so-called whim. I do wonder about the operation of grace. Just it seems almost uncanny that I would be interested in that. And in the process of that, I encountered uh, the Eastern traditions, uh, and which have, of course, uh, thousands of years of background of contemplative practice of various kinds. Um, I learned probably most about the Buddhist tradition. It, it kind of appealed to me because it, particularly in the early teachings of the Buddha, it's very pragmatic, very practical. It's not very complicated, actually. It's, it's not religious in a lot of ways. It's just very direct. And it seemed immediately true to me. It spoke to me. It's like, you know, mm. when you feel like you've come home, to something that rings really, really deeply true. Wow, everything's changing. Your mind in particular is continually changing. If you try to freeze that process and grab hold of things and turn processes into things, you will create a lot of friction for yourself, the Buddha taught. You will suffer and you will make other people suffer as well. And it's possible, which relates to my you know, current book, that with your own practice over time, you really can, all of us, rest in a profound underlying sense of contentment and love and inner peace, even amidst the challenges and pleasures of this world. Wow, that's just a really radical teaching, actually. And it, it got me deeply interested right from the get-go, uh, both that we can develop. The Buddha did not claim any special supernatural powers, right? So we can all do it. It's like he's Coach Buddha, you know? He's looking back from <laughs> the top. Coach. Of, yeah, yeah. From the Mountain of Awakening saying, yo, do what you want, but the view's a lot better up here and you don't look that happy down there. You know, I don't mean better like he's superior or anything. I just mean, you know, we change, we grow, we develop over time. So that's kind of where it began for me in 1974. I was young and foolish. Uh, there was a lot of kind of, uh, I don't know what to call it, silliness and romanticism in my own practice, but it, it rang true that within a few breaths, honestly, as you well know, you, you kind of spoke it a moment ago, a little bit ago, if you just take a few breaths, or like Kristen was teaching, Kristen Neff, put your hand on your heart. Slow down. What's it like to be you right now? Really, it's okay. What's it like to be you right now? And can you feel the clutter in your mind, the dust, the sediments gradually settling? So there's a sense of a kind of spaciousness and presence and beingness that's always the case. It's just full of dust. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really recognize it, but when the dust gradually settles inside your mind, you just feel like, okay, it's pretty good, pretty good place. And then you notice also when you kind of drop in, you're a lot more effective. You can run a business better. I have a business background. I'm very much in the real world. Um, you can be more patient with other people, do fewer things where you're pouring gasoline on the fire. You become more able to look at the world through the eyes of others because you're less attached to your own point of view, like you were saying previously. Uh, and you also find that um, you can be much more receptive to the joys of life because you're not involved in so much friction. And you can, you know, just honestly stare at a grain of sand and go, wow, look at the light sparkling bouncing off that grain of sand. So anyway, that's been the beginning for me. A lot of contemplative traditions, I think of them as like multiple roots up the mountain of awakening, many roots up. Most of them have a religious framing. You don't have to do it that way. There's tremendous secular mindfulness these days that can take you very, very far up the mountain of awakening. Uh, so whatever route people like, you know, take the step that's in front of you. Can I tell you a rock climbing thing? Yeah, please, please. I know you're avid. Uh, oh, you I know, used to hiker. <laughs> I did it a lot. But I do a lot less. Well, here's the thing. Well, often, you know, like I've taken hundreds of people climbing kind of in personal growth environments. It's all safe. I have a perfect safety record. I intend to maintain it. <laughs> anyway, so um, <clears throat> you'll see a beginner with, you know, their, their feet are on two good holds, kind of like standing on a ladder, their hands on two good holds as well, but they don't know what to do next, right? They, they can't get anything else. There's nothing else within reach. The thing to do is to stand up on the hold you've got, which will bring additional holds into reach 
and then you can keep on going. So in this life, uh, it can seem kind of daunting to develop all the ways we want to develop to heal our brain, let's say, uh, to tap into its innate healing powers, let's say. It can seem kind of daunting, like that's just a really big deal. That's, that's too big. But the step that's right in front of us to take, that's the step we can always take. Mm. You know, the most important minute of our lives is the next minute, minute after minute after minute, right? So that's one of the great lessons for me about practice, including reaching back to when I was young and really foolish. Um, just take the step in front of you. That's yeah. all you need to do. No one can stop you, but no one can take your step for you, which means that you will earn the, the fruits of your practice. Yeah, it's so, it's so beautiful. And it's also so global in the sense that when through various sources of inputs, the news, social media, whatever, we lose ourselves for a moment. And I often have friends say, yeah, I've been on social media way too much today and my mind has been all over the place and I've yeah. kind of allowed it to be hijacked. Okay, we take a pause and we say, what can we do from here? Yeah. We just, what do I need on a personal level? What do I need? Do I need a glass of water? Do I need a few yeah. moments of silence? Do I need just a little bit of time alone or a walk outside to be in nature yeah. or practicing some gratitude? And then when I'm taking care of myself and my brain and my body, then now when I'm in a good place, when I'm mindful, when I've recentered and found my footing as your example you shared, now I can go and do good for the world that's out there if I so choose to. Now I can give attention to my business if I need to. I can do what I need to do for my family. It's yeah. always the first step is stepping back into the present moment and checking in with what we need right now. Yeah. I think about how moxie is an underrated spiritual strength, <laughs> more broadly. That kind of scruffy moxie. Like, I'm going to do what I can, right? I'm not going to be defeated by all this. I'm going to find strength inside, and I'm going to keep on going with a feeling, which I, I find is absolutely fundamental as a longtime therapist, of being on your own side, being for yeah. yourself. So you've had all these interesting experiences that which, which have brought you this intersection. Yeah. Um, as you talk about in your new book, Neurodharma, where you're bringing ancient tradition with the latest science that's there, the new science. And, you know, you've written many books and I want to understand the origin story of how you chose to wrap them together in these seven principles. I was listening to a podcast uh, that you did with your son mm. I, I, um, and he was saying that uh, from the outside perspective, uh, he was saying that he thinks that this is the book that you've had the most joy with. Yeah. So well, thank I'm, you, Drew. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear a little bit about like, you know, you've been talking about these concepts, but yeah. how do you bring them together in the intersection of this book and what was the yeah. purpose of doing so? Yeah. Um, well, while I, I love ideas, I love science, I'm deeply interested in all that. Uh, I'm at bottom a practice guy. I'm really interested in practice and what can people actually do, however messed up it is right now to help things be a little bit better. So it's in that frame then that I got interested in, in what I think of as those seven fundamental practices or seven fundamental ways of being that we see perfected in the most admirable people who've ever lived. Pick your person, doesn't really matter to me, whoever that might be. And then think of them as a model of qualities you wanna develop in yourself. And then we work backwards from that to think about, okay, how can I actually grow that inside myself based on lasting changes in my own brain? So if we look at the great teachers, to me, we see seven qualities, steadiness, lovingness, fullness, by which I mean contentment and equanimity. There's an enoughness. It's nice to want more. It's nice to be ambitious. It's okay, dream big dreams, but there's a sense of enoughness already. So those three qualities hang together, steadiness of mind, mindfulness, concentration, presence, plus compassion, kindness, love, plus equanimity, resilience, and emotional balance. Those really hang well together. We also see a little more subtly and also more profoundly uh, in great beings, a sense of wholeness. They're integrated, they feel whole and complete, and they uh, engage their mind in a kind of non-dual sense, awareness and its contents together as a single field. They rest in a sense of being 
through which doing passes. And as I speak these, everyone can feel them. They're not esoteric. They're natural. They are our endowment. We don't tend to be in touch with them as much as we could be, but it's our home to be mindful and warm-hearted and calm and strong and also whole. While in the fifth quality, nowness, present moment awareness, living right at the front edge of now with its immediacy and delight and the freedom in which you're continually letting go of what's the case as the next thing arises. Receiving nowness, I call it. The sixth practice, there's a sense of inter interconnection, interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh puts it, where you open into allness. You've relax increasingly the contracted sense of self. You can see this in these great beings. They're not possessive. They're not positional. They don't get caught up in fame and what the world thinks of them. There's an inner freedom there in that regard, and they feel buoyed by everything. They, as the joke has it, the, as the Dalai Lama said to the hot dog vendor, please make me one with everything. <laughs> you know, there's that sense of it. And then last, uh, in all of them, a light shines through them that does not seem entirely their own. Uh, they speak of a sense of timelessness, of the absolute, of, of, of a stillness, a spaciousness, a vastness, an unconditioned possibility as the context of the unfolding of conditioned, determined, clockwork, big bang reality. So seven qualities, steadiness, lovingness, fullness, wholeness, nowness, allness, and timelessness. I allowed myself to be a little more poetic and lyrical uh, in the way I wrote this book. So these are the seven qualities. And I think uh, they really summarize just about any great teacher you could think of. And you can um, feel inside yourselves the way that, yeah, yeah, I'd like to be more rested in those. And so what I did in the book is I grabbed hold of the absolute coolest, latest neuroscience, the most practical cutting edge neuroscience, and applied it to the development. Okay, how do you use brain science <laughs> to develop steadiness of mind? How do you do, use brain science, like we were talking about earlier, to retain compassion in your heart for people who piss you off? Okay, right? How do you use brain science to rest in a feeling of contentment in a culture that is designed in many ways to fuel craving? Uh, the mm. kind of craving that leads to a lot of suffering and harm, flagged by the Buddha as well, 2,500 years ago. How do you actually do that, right? What do you do in your brain so that you're totally in the present? Wow. What's going on in your brain when you feel one with everything? Right? <laughs> What's happening in your brain when you edge toward nirvana, when you start moving into these spaces that people report, and many people have had experiences of where the ordinary sense of consciousness just drops out and something radically different starts shining through. What the heck? <laughs> because these things can often seem very esoteric. And yeah. They can seem very other. Yeah. And we have to think that we have to go to India yeah. on pilgrimage and yeah. sit up in the Himalayas, uh, you know, for a long time. And that magically one day, just from being very still, very that good. they'll be embraced. And what I love about what you're writing about in, in this new book is that no, there's actually things that are going on in the brain. And actually, on a practical level, we can create habits and incorporate yeah. practices, as you've mentioned, where we can em embody them. So I'm curious about the order. And as one example, so why is steadiness first? Mm -hmm. And what is an example of some of that latest neuroscience mm -hmm. and how it applies to the concept of steady steadiness? Well, that's great. Um, and to underline something you just said there a second ago, and by the way, Drew, this is a lot of fun. You know, I could, we, you're, you're good to talk with. I'm really enjoying speaking with you. Appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and exactly like you said, uh, we could other as a verb, these ways of being like, oh yeah, that's for them. Right. Or, oh, that's for a yoga camp once a, once a week, you know, once a year, right. For a week. No, these are qualities really we can develop in everyday life. We can change the circuitry in our own brains so that we have greater steadiness of mind, for example. So why is it first? Um, I had to put these in some kind of order. You know, I could have put timelessness first. You know, some people would, you know, get a sense of the infinite and inside of that do your practices. But for me, kind of logically, if you can't regulate your attention, 
you're just dead in the water. I, yeah. I often think of it, if I could just jump in really quickly, yeah. when I was looking at the order and reading about each one, I almost saw it as a foundational piece. It's a foundational yeah. piece. It's very hard to get into timelessness yeah. if we can't start at the basics. It's very yeah. hard to build, uh, you know, it's very hard to build a business empire if we can't first start with balancing our own checkbook you yeah, know, exactly and do right. our own budget on a, on a day-to-day yeah. basis. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to know where you are. You need to know what's happening inside you. You need to know what's happening around you. It's very fundamental. Going back to being in the mountains in the middle of a storm, find your footing. You know, where do you stand? So we got to start with some kind of steadying and stabilizing. Also from a neuroplasticity standpoint, what we rest our attention on is the front end of who we are becoming. Attention is like a spotlight and vacuum cleaner. It illuminates what it rests upon and then sucks it into the brain. And as William James put it a long time ago, the education of attention would be the education par excellence, right? So Mm -hmm. most people though are highly distractible their attention is skittering around all over the place. It's not stable. And there are really good practices that you can do to stabilize your mindfulness. It's easy to be mindful for half of a breath. Can you stay in the present for four breaths in a row? That's less than 30 seconds for most people. Can you stay in the present for 10 breaths in a row, for a minute, let's say in a row? That's where it starts challenging, right? So, Developing that is good. How to do it. I'll give you one uh, brain science thing that's really cool and kind of wild. Please. So, yeah. Um, if we are steadily present with something, maybe we're focused on the feeling of breathing. Maybe we want to stay present with our friend. Uh, maybe we're in a business meeting in the afternoon. It's really boring. We're sleepy. We want to keep our mind head in the game. Okay. What's going on? Well, functionally, physically in your brain, if you're steadily with something, the contents of what's called working memory remain stable. You know, you're, you're still with whatever it is you want to be with, okay? For those contents to remain stable, it means that a kind of gate that controls what is being represented by the neural circuitry of working memory, that gate stays closed. So you just keep focusing on your breath or you keep focusing on what your partner is telling you or you keep focusing on your boss's voice in that meeting droning on. You stay with whatever you're focused on. What keeps that gate closed? The gate is regulated by dopamine. When we feel rewarded, dopamine levels remain stable and the gate stays closed. But if we feel unrewarded, if what's happening doesn't feel enjoyable or meaningful or interesting in some way, dopamine levels drop, the gate opens, and then we become much more open to other inputs. This is effective in the wild. You know, if there you are, a little monkey in a tree eating your banana, you stay focused on your banana in your tree. But if the bananas run out in your tree, boom, understandably, you become much more available to stimuli from outside you about other bananas and other trees. So the other thing, the way the gate works, is that when there's a spike of dopamine, when there's a surge of new reward opportunity, the gate opens again uh, because we got to attend to that other thing. So if a cute looking monkey swings onto a branch <laughs> nearby in your tree, forget the bananas. What bananas? Yo, how are you doing today? You know what I mean? So uh, it's a very effective, simple mechanism that's grounded in dopamine. The practical takeaway is this. If what we're trying to pay attention to, such as our object of meditation, feels flat or dull or, you know, not juicy at all, understandably, where minds are going to wander. We're not getting enough stimulation. On the other hand, if we're focused on something that is interesting and stimulating, such as uh, the sensations in the whole body as we breathe or the feeling in the whole body as we walk, which is more stimulating than just tracking the sensations of breathing around your upper lip, say. And also, if we are experiencing a lot of positive emotion, even if it's subtle, like a subtle sense of peacefulness and tranquility that's really delicious, fundamental sense of well-being, or maybe we're, we're marinating in, in happiness, or even bliss, which are traditional factors of meditative absorption, by definition, we're getting high levels of dopamine in addition to steady ones. And when you're having steady levels of dopamine that are at the top of their range, you keep the gate closed 
and you prevent spikes of new dopamine opportunities from distracting you because you're already at the ceiling of dopamine levels. If so intensifying the happiness and, and the pleasure of what you're focused on will help you steady your mind. Happiness is skillful means. No, I love that. I love it. And basically, let's say if you are struggling with your meditation, you're not enjoying it or you can't stay focused, you could spice it up. There's a lot of things that you can do. Spice it up. To bring Great it in. Said. You could spice it up and you can do different things. You can try a mantra if you never tried that. You can try a walking meditation, just doing even something that brings you into that. And, you know, there's all different people have different thoughts and ideas and arguments and want to fight about what meditation vehicle is there. Ultimately, you have to find something that you could do right now that that could be a starting place for you. Yeah, heartfelt emotion, uh, loving kindness, compassion. That's an object of meditation that you can become increasingly absorbed in. And um, as you become absorbed in it, whatever the beneficial wholesome experience is, it is getting absorbed in you. Mm. So as you become absorbed in loving kindness or compassion, you are developing traits of loving kindness and compassion. If you marinate in gratitude, take gratitude as your object of meditation or the felt sense of calm strength, which is really useful these days <laughs> in the useful. plagues that we're dealing with right now, uh, calm strength. You take that as your object of meditation. Uh, yeah, that's great. Spice it you, up. You shared a quote earlier and I thought of it when, um, I, I've been familiar with this quote, uh, and I think I've even shared it on social media before, but you said the brain is like Velcro for bad experiences, right? That's our yeah. neg negativity bias. It was yeah. evolutionarily designed to pay attention even research showing for early is like toddlers, you know, pay attention to more negative experiences than positive experiences. You've read that. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's like, um, Teflon. No, sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, not Teflon. What's the word that you use? Teflon for good ones. Teflon, like a pe Teflon pan, a nonstick pan for yep. good ones. Good ones just fly right off and bad ones stick. See and you later. Gratitude. Bye-bye. <laughs> love. <laughs> so long wisdom. <laughs> and, and why I think that's so key, especially in, in this day and age, is that because our brain tends to focus on the negativity, when we don't have a sense of steady, steadiness, when we haven't embraced yeah. it, when we're not practicing it, other inputs come in, we get distracted, and more likely than not, it's going to be a negative input that gets a hold of us. Very when that good. negative input gets a hold of our brain, is very you have a downward spiral. And unless yeah. if you consciously break out of that, that's why when you go on social media or you go on Facebook and people start sharing different things and you go down the spiral, if you're not focused, if you're going in just completely, you know, not maintaining a sense of steadiness, those inputs, conspiracy theories, ideas will hijack your brain. You'll go down a rabbit hole and you'll think like an hour later, like, I don't feel good. Like what the hell just happened? <laughs> That's super well articulate. I, I should ask you a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, I really appreciate, uh, you know, the lessons and the explanation of how neuroscience uh, comes in. I know we only have a little bit more uh, time that's here. I want to talk a little bit about your practices that, that you mm. bring in. Yeah. Um, what are some of the ways that still today that you're able to incorporate for you on a personal level? You know, everybody wants to know what yeah. you do on a personal level. It's a great question, isn't it? We want it, I don't care what they think. I want to know what they do. Yes. Yeah. And with you being an avid person that says, you know, I care about the science, care about the research, care about everything yeah. like that that's important, but ultimately I want to put the emphasis on the practices. Yeah. What are some of the practices that you do on a daily basis that incorporate some of these seven principles? Yeah, that's great. Um, so I've been at this for a while and it, it's just natural to say that. So what I might do myself might seem a little subtle or something, but it's, it's not out of reach for anyone. Uh, one is that I try to stay in touch with an underlying feeling that's innate to us in our own psychology. And in my view as well, starts edging into something that's transpersonal, but an People don't have to go to that place if they don't want to. Just innate in our own ordinary psychology, you can be in touch with an underlying, undisturbed spaciousness of awareness that has qualities in it deep down inside of um, serenity and lovingness and contentment. You can feel that. You can feel that while you're also appalled or worried, 
or focused on making a cup of coffee when you get up in the morning. In other words, you can feel both. And and I want to just, it may seem kind of obvious or simple. Most of us are not in touch with both. The truth is you can feel both. While you're upset with your friend, you can feel an underlying stability of lovingness inside yourself, for example. While you're really worried about uh, what to do in the country, let's say, or you're fascinated by what's happening in the streets, you can stay in touch with this underlying feeling of well-being as the container or the field of all of it. So I, that's a lot my practice. I, I try to do that in real time every day. Another thing I really try to do <laughs> going to the negativity bias is disengage from friction quickly. To feel it, totally not fake it, no spiritual bypassing here, right? No rose-colored glasses. Feel it, but disengage fast. Uh, just don't feed it, don't follow it. Uh, and what would be examples of the friction? Yeah. So I roll out of bed. Um, I, you know, wake up, uh, I read political Twitter a little bit, and I suddenly see this, you know, comment about a comment, and my mind is starting to get drawn into that idiot who said that thing, don't they understand, blah, blah. Here I am arguing in my mind with someone that someone reposted on Twitter. (laughs) What a waste of time, right? That's a form of friction for me, you know, contentiousness. It's, a, it's interesting. It's a, it's a rubbing up against life, right? It's or, when you notice yourself arguing with some version of reality yeah. that's out there. Yeah, that's a form of friction. Or my wife comes out and, um, you know, she's a little sleepy. I want a real good hug. She's got other things on her mind. Uh, she just kind of keeps on rolling on by. Uh, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, why don't you give me a bigger hug? You know, <laughs> and then I'm thinking, I don't need to go there. Like, yeah, maybe later I'll say, hey, honey, let's have more of a hug, whatever. Uh, but I don't need to get caught up in it. I don't need to follow it. That's where we really get in trouble. So I, that's a very, and, and it's interesting, when everything's fun, you can afford to be a slob. <laughs> when, you, when you're at sea level, you can jog with a brick in your backpack. But when you're at 20,000 feet helping your friends up the mountain, you can't afford that stuff. So I think right now we're in the middle of a lot of trouble. And when you're in the middle of a lot of trouble, you can't afford your, dare I say it, different forms of BS. You know, you just got to drop it, including understandable reactions from your childhood that get brought into the present. I get it, you know, um, you know, but we just can't afford them. But that's different from a course of claiming what you actually recognize is true and what you really, really care about. I'm not talking about pushing away anything that's really healthy, anything that's really important. But I think we can admit that we get into a lot of needless friction inside our own mind. So I'll let, try to let that go. And i say a last thing, just if I could really fast, I try to be in touch with this feeling of loving peacefulness, peaceful lovingness, that intersection of calm and compassion where there's an open-hearted, kind of an open-hearted peacefulness or a peaceful open-heartedness. You can feel the two together. Uh, Sometimes it's more active. It's like compassion and clarity both together. So, for example, when you see someone out there in the world you disagree with, you can have crystal clear clarity about them and what you think while keeping an open heart and not letting the poison of hatred invade you and, and remain. You were mentioning inside the book about the ever rising level of concern around increasing internet usage and some of the studies that are out there. Austin, what can you tell us about what we know about the internet and over usage and its implications on the brain? Well, I want to make it a clear point here that technology is not a bad thing. Technology is a wonderful thing. And when we were researching this book, we were able to access studies that have been published on every corner of the earth because of technology. Even cell phones, wonderful thing. I was able to FaceTime with my dad when I was out in Oregon and he was in Florida. The point we have to make here though is what are we doing with this technology? Are we using it or is it using us? And as you mentioned, almost 70% of the world's population already has a smartphone and these numbers are projected to continue increasing. So why does all this matter so much? Well we can get stuck with our technology where it's taking us away from the things that we know are linked to lasting health to lasting happiness for example the in-person interpersonal um, interpersonal interactions that we have with other people 
This isn't to say that video chatting is a bad thing. It's to say, what are we doing if we spend several hours on social media blindly scrolling through other people's feeds? What we talk about in the book is that there's a need to have a better approach to this. There's a need for an approach where we can use technology and benefit from us, but not or benefit from it, but not have all these consequences happen. Consequences like becoming more disconnected from other people. Consequences like becoming more polarized against other people's opinions. Things that take away from our overall quality of life and I would say on a larger picture of the world are taking us away from seeing the similarities that we share as opposed to looking at these differences that become so glaring when you watch the news or go on social media. We came up with this tool called TIME. It's an acronym and it stands for the following. First, T, time limited, time restricted. When you're going online, when you're watching TV, even if you're listening to the radio or going on your cell phone, you wanna set a window where you feel comfortable spending that time. So let's say you wanted to watch a TV show. The TV show is 30 minutes. You set a timer for 30 minutes, and when that timer goes off, you're done. So time restricted. I is intentional. You wanna be intentional about what you're trying to do. I can say that I've had experiences where all of a sudden I find myself on Instagram. I don't really remember how I got there. It's kinda of like when you're driving in a car and all of a sudden you realize you went 30 miles and don't exactly know where you've been going. So intentional, have a purpose to what you're trying to do. If you wanna go on online and check in with a friend, do that thing, but set it out beforehand so you don't find 10 minutes later you're out checking out some conspiratorial sites. How about M? Well, M is mindful. That means when you're engaging with your digital technology, you wanna be mindful of what's happening. How are you feeling? When you start watching the news because you wanna be informed, do you find yourself feeling really stressed, which is actually now that news is so negative, a common occurrence. If you're feeling stressed, is it actually a benefit to you anymore? Are you, are you still learning something from watching that news or is it just detracting from your overall quality of life? And then E is for enriching. This may be the most important part of it. I like to think any interaction I have should be enriching my life in some way or another. And when you put yourself in a digital world, there's a high chance that your attention is going to be sucked into some black hole or another. You're gonna find yourself uh, watching a whole bunch of videos that added absolutely nothing to your life. You might find yourself reading comments on some sort of hateful post. You might find yourself watching three hours of reality TV. And I'm not saying that reality TV is bad. I'm saying, how does that improve your quality of life? And so you wanna make sure that it's enriching. And I think a great place to start is after you've had a digital experience, you'll kind of know. You can, you can pause and say, was that a net benefit in my life? And if not, that's the time to look at it and to make some changes. I think you make an important point is that these apps are, and there's great things from them. I've met so many friends, people are listening to us using some app that's out there, but they've been designed to hijack your attention exactly right and you know this isn't conspiracy theory we know that the pop-up ads that appear when you're online are designed for exactly what drew was interested in last week so it's we're not talking about something that people don't know about that the next youtube video that's queued up happens to be similar to the last one but kind of maybe nuanced by where you were a week ago so you know it, it it's it's reality the the other point i think is that uh, especially as it relates to the t of of the test of time that Austin was talking about is, you know, we know that uh, the average American spends six hours or more in front of a screen of one sort or another every single day, which in the average lifetime will add up to 22 years spent in front of a screen. And, you know, the implications of that in terms of the blue light, the digital experience, the corrupting of your brain, another discussion, what I want to bring up right now is when you're doing one thing, you're not doing something else. So that is valuable time that you could have been uh, outside. You could have been having personal relationships with other people. Uh, you could have been exercising. You could have been shopping, planning your meal, building your meal, you know, con constructing the meal with other people, and really engaged in the things that we all know are going to be, to use Austin's word, net positive. So just that uh, the amount of time that is being dedicated you know, it's been estimated that about 6% of the world's population suffers from internet addiction. And that is, you know, being on the internet so much that it, it grossly interferes with your life engagement. So that's a, it's a big number. We know that 
adolescents who are uh, overly involved in social media actually have demonstrable changes in their brains, have reduction in the corpus callosum. That's the white matter pathway connecting the right and left hemispheres to each other. And we don't know what the implications are of, of that change in the brain, but it's probably not a good thing to suddenly start disconnecting. You know, it's another part of disconnection syndrome. I never thought of that before, of disconnecting one hemisphere from the other because they're connected, obviously, for an important reason. And again, finally, we, we, we love digital technology. I mean, it allows, it allows us to do amazing things, but we have to put this into context of our overall 24-hour experience. You know, so much of behavior change, and you guys are physicians, so you're always working with patients and trying to help them is, okay, there, there's what you can cut out and there's what you can add in. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people get stuck because, okay, I'm gonna take those things out of spending as much time on the internet, but they don't know, sometimes we've forgotten about what to add in. It kind of goes back to this, the rat model, the mice model, where we've heard this term of like, cocaine is, uh, sugar is as, a, as addictive as cocaine. But when they took that same model of, of the mice and they put them in sort of a rat colony where there was a lot of things to do and so many other things, they found that sugar is not as addictive. So personalize it for us in your own lives, each one of you, how do you find that time for connection? What does it really look like that can give our listeners inspiration for what they can add in to give them more options to actually connect? Well, you know, people tend to uh, fill their days uh, with one thing or another. If there's free time, it somehow gets filled. And I, I think the point that we really want to make uh, and we talk about so much in Brainwash is that there are some activities that are powerfully net positive, that are geared specifically at reestablishing that connection, offsetting disconnection syndrome, reestablishing connection to the prefrontal cortex. And these are things that we don't want to find time for. We don't want to find time for exercise. We don't want to find time, for example, for meditation. We want to make time. And the difference is finding time is kind of low priority. Making time for these things is much higher priority. So if we slot in a given amount of time each day that is uh, un undeniable, it's part of the schedule for our exercise, for meditation, then those times of day cannot be uh, uh, utilized for mindless time online or filled by use doing something that's not really net positive. The E, uh, in, in as Austin described, in the time acronym, is it enriching for you? Meditation is enriching. Uh, physical exercise is clearly enriching. Re uh, personal relationships, being with other people, reconnecting with people is enriching. Nature exposure is positive. So. It's all about the triage, isn't it? It's about um, you know ranking these activities, and unfortunately, slowly but surely, the mindless time spent in front of the screen works its way up to being you know as mentioned six hours of your day for the average American. So it's got to be put much much lower, and we have to recognize that it's a great tool, but we have to contextualize that. And on a personal level. When you think about your schedule for the week, on a week that let's say you're not traveling or on a week that you are traveling out here doing interviews in Los Angeles, is it a little bit like meal prep? You think about it on like the weekend and look at your week ahead and slot in those times. Do you have it automatic in your routine? How have you made these activities that you love to do and that bring you towards connection? How do you make them a reality as part of your week on like a scheduling basis? Well, everyone who's involved uh, in looking at what our schedule demands and primarily that's people to know, but in the studio, Andrew Lure. Uh, he knows darn well that we need to meditate every day and that we need to have good food and that there's got to be time for exercise. So here we are uh, far from home. We, we live in Florida. Here we are in California. And every morning has been exercise, uh, meditation uh, in the hotel room. Uh, you, you know, we do our very best to find the very best food that's available. These are on the top of the list. And we love you, but you're below those things in terms of what matters. Uh, those are the life-sustaining choices that we make that are the non-negotiable. So then the other things that we do as part of what we do in our lives, you know, the vocational things are important, but truly uh, making those priorities uh, enhances this moment with you. And communicating with other people. So many times Absolutely. when people feel guilty, I'll ask them, okay, let's start at like number one. Have you told even if you don't have a team and you're not an author or a thought leader, let's just say somebody that has a family. Have you told your 
wife that this is a priority for you? Have you told your husband that this is a priority for you? Have you communicated with your work that, hey, listen, I'll take that early morning call, but then I go to the gym and then I come back. And I often hear that people feel guilty because they haven't even told people yet. So now they're doing that activity sometimes and they get a call from somebody or an interruption and it pulls them away from that. So even communicating, as you were hinting to earlier, is such a key part of that. Austin, what have you... Let me get, get, yes. get back to... That's a decision. Yes. It's making that decision, which is what we're all about here. It's making the commitment and working. The first step is working on the decision-making apparatus, working on increasing your ability then to not only just to recognize what's good for you, but then to commit to doing it. On the topic of community, because it's such a big topic. And I mean, in the subtitle of the actual book, you have lasting happiness, deeper relationships. Deeper relationships is about connection. How on a practical level does it show up in your life? And how do you make it a priority? I, I think it's it's a lot easier to talk about all of these things if you have all of your days free. And for a lot of listeners, that's not going to be the case. You're gonna be busy at work, you're gonna be doing things. So it's a question of how do you build these things in? And for me, that was most relevant when I was in residency. I was sometimes in the hospital 80 or so hours a week. And so there weren't all these extra windows where I could spend several hours meditating. And so I'll say, first of all, nature, that was my way of reconnecting. I would go out into the woods and then you by yourself with by others, yourself a lot of the by time. Yourself. And I'm a big proponent of doing this with other people. But for me, that was the meditation piece. It was the exercise piece. It was going out into the middle of nowhere in the gloomy, gloomy Pacific Northwest winters, mm -hmm. which I love. Don't get me wrong, but walking around these trees and just having the time to decompress. And we know that nature lowers levels of stress. So that makes a lot of sense. I wanted to make a point with regard to how do you get yourself to start doing these things? And one of the problems that we have is that the barrier to open your phone, to opening your phone and opening an app is so low. If you're sitting there and there's that moment of discontent, you take out your phone, you see what your friends are up to on social media, and the whole process is over before you even thought about it. Why that's important is if you want to start making positive lifestyle changes, and that might be going to the gym, that might be spending time with your friends, realize it's not going to be as easy as that right off the bat. And that's why, as you mentioned, scheduling these things out and having a plan is so important. One thing that worked well for me was just forcing myself every week to do something with new people that would be initially uncomfortable and eventually built upon those experiences. For me, that was joining meetup groups. This is a website where you can find various conversations, various groups of people that get together, sometimes that talk about things you may or may not actually be that interested in. But to say, I want to improve my quality of life. I know that interpersonal bonds are one of the ways of doing this. Everyone that I knew at the time was busy in the hospital. And so this was a way of making new connections with people who had differing opinions, with people who had differing lives. But you gotta make that commitment. You have to make that decision that you want to get out and start fostering those connections. And that's why coming back to the, the model we introduce in Brainwash, it may be really hard for a person to say, I'm gonna go out and spend time with other people, even though they know that's what they wanna do. It may be hard for them to put on those shoes and go to the gym or to eat the right foods. We need to set our brains up so those decisions are easier, those decisions we want to make. And so for an average person, that might mean you're doing okay on a couple of these things, but maybe it's the nature. That's the one that you really focus on because that'll give you that extra boost it takes to then make the decision to get out and spend time with more people. It may not be that you can force yourself to eat that healthy food that you know you should be eating. So you find a back door and that back door might be, again, nature. Nature lowers your stress levels, makes your decision making a little more rational. And now you can actually get yourself to eat that food that you know is good for you. So if I'm hearing you correctly, sometimes the pathway forward in an area of your life that you feel stuck on could be working on one of these other spokes. That's exactly because right. Because you're working on your decision making. Exactly yeah. right. That's great. You know, that really, I want to touch on one more of these areas that's so crucial because, and then I want to talk about, you talked about the plan and the roadmap that you've uh, listed out in the 10 day brainwash, which I think is worthwhile going through to help people understand how to actually make this happen and give them a little bit of a preview of what's in the book. But I want to talk about exercise because that's always one that people seem to struggle with. 
I know for myself, I've always tried different sorts of components and then found out that for myself, I really do need to work with somebody one-on-one or have like a friend that's kind of, that I'm like training with. I go hiking, I go surfing, I do stuff with uh, a lot of the close friends in my life, but to really make serious progress on exercise, which was a priority for me, I need to work with somebody one-on-one. The first part of reclaiming these things that are hacking our health is understanding why they're so important. So what does the relationship, what's the relationship between exercise and our decision-making process? That's a phenomenal question. Look, we all know exercise is good for us. There's no one out there on podcast saying exercise less. And why is it good for us? Well, it improves basically every aspect of our health from longevity to heart health. We want to focus on something different. And that is what does exercise do for our decision making? And looking at these meta analyses of both acute exercise and chronic exercise, exercise improves our executive functions. We haven't really talked about that as a term, but executive functions are this reflection of a a highly functional prefrontal cortex. Executive functions are things like cognitive flexibility, working memory, impulse control, attentional control. These are absolutely essential to making good choices. So if we can improve our executive functions by exercise, and that might mean going to the gym and going on the treadmill, or it might mean lifting weights, This is an entry point to better decision-making. And I wanna also comment on something you said, which is you do better working with another person. So important to experiment so that you can sustain the exercise. A lot of people, they say, I'm gonna be now somebody who goes to the gym for an hour every single day. And they do it for a week or two weeks, and then they can't go for an hour, and then they're done. The goal with exercise is to make it an enjoyable experience. So I'd much rather have somebody go for a long walk with a friend then go to the gym for three days and say they're done. If they can do that long walk with a friend a few times a week and do that each week. Also, spending time with other people seems to amp up those executive improvements. So that's why I would say, while you're trying to experiment with exercise, try to draft somebody else in. And that could be a friend, it could be a family member, it could even be a stranger. Some of these groups will have meetups where they meet out uh, on a hill or in a park and they do a simple walk together, but it's a goal to find a sustainable movement plan, not exercise necessarily, but a movement plan. And if you can get out there and do those 20 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercise five times a week, fantastic. You know, that's what we know bumps up BDNF. There are all sorts of benefits that we'll get from that level of exercise. But if it's a question between staying on your couch and feeling upset because you couldn't go to the gym for an hour or just going for a walk around the neighborhood, it's always better to do some movement because again, we're looking at this from the perspective of improving decisions. And once you can consistently improve your decisions, you're gonna increase the chances that you go to the gym or go on that walk. So it's just getting things moving in the first place. I hope you enjoyed that mashup. If you did and you wanna learn more, check out this interview with my dear friend, Dr. Dale Bredesen, all on the end of Alzheimer's. We are at increased risk when we spend more time indoors. Of course, indoors is where the refrigerator is. Indoors (laughs) is where the sedentary lifestyle is. Indoors is where the couch and the TV are.